So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to this event. My name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager for London South Bank University. Delighted to be here. You'll see that I'm joined on screen by all the people that you're going to be meeting across the course of the afternoon um, for our event, Child Q, How Can African and Caribbean Children Be Safeguarded? Before I hand over to my colleagues, Denise and Arlene, for our, uh, for our welcome and scene setting, I'm just going to take you through some virtual housekeeping. I'm starting with a short statement on respect and dignity. Um, so everyone attending or speaking at an LSBU event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates an environment built on equality, inclusion and acceptance. We value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including that that potentially contradicts LSBU's reputation and values will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any example of such behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be an enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. So thank you for adhering to those guidelines and I'm sure we won't have any problems today. Um, so just to take you through the Zoom functionality, we are in Zoom webinar. Um, and that means that um, you can kind of see and hear us. And um, it means you can't turn your cameras and microphones on, um, but you can engage using the chat box. Um, and it's great to see people doing so already. It's wonderful to see your introductions. Please continue to use the chat box to let us know who you are, what you do and where you're joining us from, um, as well as sharing your thoughts and comments throughout the event. We want to hear from you. Um, far from detracting from the event, the chat box helps to bring the event to life um, and we do record the chat box as well. And that helps to inform future events and activities. Um, and it's great to know, uh, to know what, you are, what you're thinking throughout the event. Um, we, we do not have the Q&A function um, enabled today. Um, that's because we have so many people joining, um, but we have taken what you've said on board. So at registration stage, we asked you to let us know what you wanted to get out of attending the event. Um, and that has informed the questions that we will be putting to our panel during the panel discussion um, later on this afternoon. We have enabled closed captioning, which are the subtitles that you can see appearing on your screen right now. If you don't wish to see them, you can hide them. Um, by clicking the little up arrow next to CC Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and choose to hide subtitles, but we do enable those in the interest of inclusivity and accessibility. The, the, um, the event is divided into two parts. There's part one, which is this webinar, um, and that will consist of um, presentations by our wonderful speakers who are joining on the screen. Um, our speakers will have a variety of times to present. Um, when they have one, one minute remaining, they'll hear a bell, and when they have two minutes, uh, to, uh, when they have a few seconds to sum up, they'll hear two bells. After their presentations, we will be um, hearing uh, from a panel discussion with those questions. Uh, we'll then take a short break and reset at four o'clock for our breakout sessions. Um, and that will take an hour and you should have received your separate join in link for those breakout sessions. That's all from me. I finally just ask you to um, invite you to share your thoughts and your comments on Twitter as well. Um, we love to see them and it helps to bring the conversation to a wider audience beyond just the event itself. So enjoy this afternoon. I'm, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues um, and leave you in their hands. Thanks so much. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Arlene Weeks. I want to thank you all for attending what I believe is going to be a really thought provoking event. Um, I want to thank LSBU for supporting the conference, especially Neil, as you can see, he's our brilliant events manager, and to the Dean of our school for supporting the um, conference. And I particularly want to give a shout out to my colleague, um, Denise, who's been my mentor and sounding board for out, and also to um, the guest speakers, as um, Neil's also mentioned. I'm going to start off by saying much has been written about the experiences of black children and especially black Caribbean children, namely the sizable number that leave the UK's educational system significantly behind their peers. Why, you might ask, there's no evidence um, that says they're inherently less able. In recent decades, much has been um, done to address this question and it's been attributed to institutionalized racism or unconscious bias. But while such explanations have their place, they do not go far enough. While socioeconomic disadvantage um, arguably exists, it exists for all social groups. Why should this situation be worse for black Caribbean children? The truth is attitudes towards black people are still, I believe, rooted in the 19th century. 
the legacy of the colonial past is such that those from the Caribbean are subconsciously still viewed as slaves, as property to be traded. So from the moment black children enter the UK's institution, I believe they are at risk, as was deplorably demonstrated in the case of Child Q. To correct this situation, I believe that institutions need to change and the professionals within them need to address their issues of bias, bias sorry, towards black children. Only then can the UK begin to climb to a truly equal society. Now I'm aware that many people don't like the term child Q, but for me, it's appropriate to afford her the necessary anonymity. She's a young lady that I've never met, but as a social worker of over 32 years, I believe that this will give her the necessary space to heal and the time that she will need to be supported. She has gone through what is a very traumatic experience. It was, of course, a deplorable incident, yet it's important to note that no laws were broken. The teachers and police officers concerned acted as they did because they didn't see her, I believe, as a teenager in 2020. It's my assertion that somewhere in their makeup, they saw her perhaps as a child in the 1820s, where at that time, whites would have viewed her as property, an item to be sold at auction. And as such, she would have been pulled, prodded, her arms and breasts felt to see how strong enough she was. Such a child would never have been allowed education as such a course would have given her ideas above her station. Now jump forward 200 years, to the UK in 2020 when the incident occurred. Teachers and police officers decided to take child Q out of her exam and strip searched her for drugs. And as we know, no drugs were found. According to the local child safeguarding review, child Q, the decision was based on her color. I quote, the review believes there to be a high level of prob probability that practitioners were influenced in this regard. The, dis dis sorry, the disproportionate decision to strip search child Q is unlikely to have been un disconnected from her ethnicity and her background as a child growing up on a Hackney estate. The parallels with 1820 are disturbing. We seem to have progressed very little. Now I'm going to start my um, narrative in a way that might seem unacademic because this is the place that I want to start in terms of my belief and, and value system. I is black, I is a woman, I is an older sister, I is a godmother, I is an auntie, I is a widow. I'm a social worker, I'm a colleague, I'm a service manager, I'm a trainer, I'm an academic and I'm a lecturer. Now, that narrative, which I started with, is commonly known as Patwa, because it's important for people to locate me in all my identities as I do myself. It's important for you to hear me say in the words of Maya Angelou, I am a phenomenal woman. But it's important for you to understand that when I leave this institution, where I work as a part-time lecturer, people don't see Dr. Weeks, they see a black woman. I experience people grabbing their bags when I'm on the train, shop assistants following me around the store. And on a good day, I'll say nothing, but catch me on a bad day. And I'll point out to them that I earn more money than they do. And I'll go around the store and I'll touch everything and not buy anything. My experiences mirror the experience of thousands of pounds and pound thousands of black people. But my curiosity how, about people's thinking resulted in my PhD research on the complexities of decision-making for adoption and fostering panel. However, the conclusions go beyond the parameters of adoption and fostering panels. The findings apply to decision-making in all arenas. I developed a theory called effective personal and professional judgment. With the hashtag, and the strap line, increased personal awareness increases professional effectiveness. My students will testify that I've taught them that
that to be an effective social work pr practitioner, they need to know what informs their thinking and decision making. For how can they affect change in someone else without knowing themselves? Through my reach research lens and the theory of EPPJ, my hypothesis is that the belief and value systems of the teachers and police officers on that day was such that they failed to see child Q as a teenager sitting an exam. Flawed thinking led to flawed decision making. Their belief that she was in possession of drugs led to her taking her out of the exam and strip searching her whilst on her menstruation circle, cycle. While no drugs were found, they sent her back to her an exam room, then eventually home as though this traumatic event was routine. As a social work practitioner of over 32 years, I've chaired conferences where teachers and police officers were in attendance, who if they had heard that a parent had stripped and humiliated their child because they believed the child had drugs, those same professionals would have said that the child needed to be subjected to a child protection plan, with the expectation that the parent would need to undertake some form of training to facilitate a change in their parenting style. So we as a group of professionals could decide if that parent was able to continue parenting their child. But with child crew, the police officers and the teachers who subjected her to sexual, emotional and physical abuse were told that the government is waiting for the police to do their own investigation and that Hackney Council is waiting for the police to complete their effect their investigation before they do anything. Ring any bells? Neville and Doreen Stevens had to wait six years for the McPherson report in 1999 that uncovered major unfailings um, in the police investigation, defining the term institutionalized racism following the murder of their son Stephen in 1993. My aim for this conference is that it provides an opportunity to explore how African and Caribbean children can be safeguarded. It's a call for action and to action. Now, I make no apology for the fact that today is not a, a child, all child matters conference. It's an afternoon about black children mattering. I also make no apology that all the speakers are black academics and professionals because we have something to say about the subject. We have a view on what the system is doing to our children and why it's doing this. Because we're tired of hearing from white academics or white professionals about the black experience. The audience, however, is ethnically mixed. This tells me that there are non-black allies who are interested in changing the experiences for black children. And there are also black people who want to do something. Whilst I'm wanting to begin the conversation, my desire is that this is an opportunity to hear, or as my mum would say, not to just pick out the words of our mouth. It's a space that attendees should not simply get answers to their questions. I would like all attendees to think about what they can do themselves and what they can require, even compel their organisations to do. What happened to child Q should not have happened. It is and was inexcusable. But coming from my own value base, which is Christian, two passages come to mind that galvanized me into action. Genesis 50 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of lives. And that was verse 20, sorry. And Esther 414. And what and who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this? What does this mean? I believe that out of this harrowing case, change will happen for African and Caribbean children. As a black practitioner and social worker, a researcher and lecturer. I have been afforded the opportunity to influence the practice of future social workers. So if you want to study at um, social work, 
come to LSBU where we are beginning to explore such subjects. If you're a practitioner in any profession, come and join our CPD courses. Finally, encourage your organizations to fund research on race issues so we can challenge, reduce, and eventually eradicate racist practice. The research and thinking for this space that we're in is to look at people's value base and belief systems that are at play. And they were at play for the teachers and police officers who have a default position that determines, unfortunately, the life experiences for Black African and Black Caribbean children. There is no quick fix and no overnight fix, but there are definable and achievable actions that can be taken as a first step to remedy this. One of these actions, and probably the most effective, is to encourage and enable white people from doctors to shop owners, to police, to teachers, to be aware of their biases towards black people. The aim would be to redefine expectations of the black community in terms of academic abilities and performance, and to break the default assumptions that connect race and deviant behavior. Abuses such as the disproportionate exclusion of an adultification of children, we commonly know it as racial profiling and labeling, disproportionate incarceration of black males in prison and mental health institution, the poor treatment of black Caribbean and African women should become a thing of the past. To effect change will require all of us to change our pedagogy. The curriculum of all learning institutions must be made to be culturally relevant to black people by the use of appropriate language and terminology, which will be beneficial for the combating of racism. In these new curricula, topics such as the history of the UK's involvement in the slave trade and the reasons why the Cari people from the Caribbean came to the UK after World War II will be a contribution and be of benefit to all people. Only then will the UK begin to be an equal society. To end my bit, I want to say that if you want to look at how values and beliefs shape decision making, come to the group that I'm facilitating. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, um, Denise, to host the rest of the event. Over to you, Denise. Uh, thank you, Arlene, and good afternoon to everybody that's joined us. Um, thank you to our amazing panel who are here to share some thoughts, some ideas, and to really get us thinking about this matter at hand, and to have, as I've seen in the chat, some difficult and critical conversations. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker. Now, we've carefully, Arlene and I carefully selected the people that we wanted on our panel. We wanted people who were not only passionate about the cause, but also who had a voice and were in a position that where we could affect change. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's none other than our very own Diane Abbott, MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington. Thank you, Diane, for joining us. And I'll just give the screen over to you to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? We can. Very good. I'm always very wary of technology. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this important event. And I want to begin by saying we should just take a minute really to think about Child Q. Child Q went through uh, a humiliating and brutalizing experience and she and her family are still in great pain. So we should always remember that the child cue episode isn't a, a paper exercise or a, or a theme for conferences. It's a real young woman and a real black family who've gone through intense humiliation and pain. And the situation has not been resolved yet. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was we need to be clear that what happened to Child Q in Hackney is not an isolated incident. 
it encapsulates in a way the, the fact that generations of black British school children have been the victims of institutional racism in policing and education. So it's not an isolated incident. It's not something that's particular to Hackney. It's not a teacher that made a mistake or a police officer that didn't fill in the correct form. It represents systemic issues and systemic issues that some of us have been raising for decades. Like all of you, I was very shocked when I heard what had happened to child Q. And of course, how the police behaved was, was very bad indeed, but how the teachers behaved was in some ways even worse. The pretext for calling the police to the school was that they smelt cannabis on child Q. They'd done this before. They, uh, I think a few weeks earlier, they thought they smelt cannabis. They, they had her search, they found nothing. And almost as if to spite her, a few weeks later, they did the same thing. They, they, they decided they smelled cannabis on her and they called the police. Now, let's just stop and think. If you're interested in safeguarding a child, and if you think you're smelling cannabis on him or her, surely, what you should be doing is trying to get them support, trying to get them therapy, trying to, to, to get them the right kind of help with the issue. And of course, talking to their parents. What you don't do, what you don't do is call the police. And as you probably all know, they did not tell the parents they were calling the police. They did not communicate with the parents. The first the mother of child Q knew that her daughter had been strip searched in this humiliating way was when the child came home from school. So I want to ask, what did those teachers think they were doing? I mean, no one's gonna tell me you don't have drugs in private schools. No one's gonna tell me that you don't have children who may be experimenting with drugs outside of school hours. Have you ever heard of private school teachers and their teachers calling the police to their school because of a suspicion of drug abuse? No, you have not, but it happens in majority, global majority schools in boroughs like Hackney. So let's be clear, this isn't about helping child cure or any other child that finds themselves in that position. It's about acting out and playing out a set of prejudgments about our children. So the first question is how, how do you change the atmosphere in those classrooms? which makes them think that the appropriate first response to smelling cannabis on a child is to call the police. Bear in mind that if this was an adult or a young person on the street, the police couldn't strip search them because they just smelled cannabis. That has been ruled out some time ago. So what do you do with an atmosphere and a way of thinking in a school staff room that thinks that what is inappropriate to a person walking along the street is appropriate for a schoolgirl. Now, these are, you know, institutional racism in education is a, is a, is a long standing issue. Um, there's this training you can give, and I'm sure there'll be some discussion um, in this event this afternoon. But I think that you also need to move towards having a critical mass of black and global majority teachers in the staff room because you're never going to change the thinking in those staff rooms until you have enough teachers that look like the children they're supposed to be teaching because it's very very hard to break down those preconceptions to break down those prejudices not least because a lot of these teachers think they're very liberal they'll tell you they went to an anti-Nazi league march 10 years ago, 20 years ago. You really can't tell them anything about racism, but of course, black and global majority children continue to suffer, continue to be discriminated against. And I think the key to changing that is to changing the breakdown of teachers, but also 
black and minority ethnic teachers at senior levels also. And I think, I think the same is true of social work. So there's issues about training. There's issues about having more black professionals and at management levels in teaching and social work. And there's also issues actually about how these schools are managed. Um, there's a particular issue which we may not discuss today, the issue about academies, which were brought in um, by the Tories, they're very proud of them, and academies do get good academic results in many ways, but also academies, they, they make their own rules in relation to the relationship with the outside world and in relationship to the way they engage with the police. And we do need to look at the relationship of academies with local education authorities, um, not just in terms of the relationship to the police, but levels of exclusions and generally how they engage with issues of safeguarding, particularly safeguarding of black and brown children. Because you know, as I, as I just said, what type of safeguarding is it when your first response to a child who may have a problem um, is to call the police? And you have to wonder whether they would have done this had it been a white child. You really have to wonder. So it's those types of preconceptions and those sorts of prejudgments and those sorts of thinking that we have to break down in the staff room and in social work. And it means more black, minority ethnic professionals. It means better training. It means better support. And it means racial justice and fighting racial inequality, not just being a sort of add-on, being absolutely fundamental to your practice. Because in my experience, white professionals in some walks of life, they're quick to talk about diversity if it means, you know, more funding or more jobs for them, but less quick to really center the thinking and the understanding of black children, their parents and their community to their practice. So um, the, the other issue I wanted to raise was about, as, as you all know, Child Q is in the middle of taking her exams and the teachers call the police and again, um, you do wonder what they were thinking about. And now we come to the issue of policing and policing schools. Because the question a lot of people are asking is who gives the police the authority to strip search our children when they couldn't lawfully do it if they were adults walking down the street because they smelt cannabis? Um, I, you know, what were the police thinking of? I think that there's an extent to which too many white institutions dehumanize people of color. And in this incident, the fact that the police were prepared to strip search her when she was on her menstrual period, the fact that they wouldn't let her clean herself up, the fact that they wouldn't let her get a fresh pad, the fact that they did this and they didn't think to ask the teachers, you know, have the parents been contacted? Is there, a, is there a, a responsible adult here? The fact that they did that is the extent to which they dehumanize our children. People call it adultification, and, and that's, you know, that's an, that's an interesting concept. But in the end, it's about dehumanizing our, dehumanizing our children and not behaving as if they are children like other children, who have vulnerabilities like other children, who need to be protected and safeguarded like other children. But another part of the entire scandal is the fact that this practice of strip searching children, particularly black children, I think is more prevalent than I think we've understood up until now. Initially, we were told it was an isolated incident, but then when people started to get a little deeper, they found it wasn't isolated at all. The BBC put in a FOI request and found that three quarters of them responded and what they learnt 
was that over a five year period, there were 13,000 strip searches of young children. That's over 50 a week, 50 children a week being strip searched in our schools up and down the country. And, and only three out of every four police forces responded. So what the actual number is, is likely to be even greater. And the BBC also reported that separate data revealed that 75% of the children who were strip searched by the Met in custody over the past three years were from ethnically diverse backgrounds. So on the one hand, they are strip searching many more young people than we think, either in school or in custody, and 75% of them are black and global majority children. Um, so we have to ask, and maybe we can discuss it today, why is there such a huge disproportion of our young people being subjected to this humiliating treatment? And anecdotally, it seems to be that young women, young black women are in particular singled out for this treatment. To my mind, and I'm happy to discuss it with people in the audience today, but strip searching is being used in a discriminatory way, not about investigation. Um, it seems to yield next to nothing in terms of evidence of serious crime, but it's designed to humiliate and punish. And it's clear that this was the case in relation to child. You remember, this was a child who had no history of bad behavior, so academically high achieving children in the school, they had strip search, searched her before and found nothing. Um, the mother came up at school to complain. And as I say, it's almost like despite the family, they brought back the police to actually strip search the child. So I think we need to examine this practice of using strip searching as a form of punishment. And we need to be insisting that if the police want to strip search somebody, they need to charge them and it needs to take place in a police station in the presence of responsible adults and legal representation. I believe that we need to get strip searching in an essentially punitive way out of our schools, full stop. But then the other question which comes up is what are police doing in our schools at all? Now, um, in Hackney, certainly the police are very keen on having police in schools, the local authority um, supports them, but the, the reality is that you have in police in schools almost invariably in areas with high proportions of black and brown children and in areas of multiple deprivation. And, you know, the police are not in schools to help the children. Um, they're not in public schools where there's plenty of drugs and other criminal activity. I believe that one of the problems with the police presence in schools is it reinforces a series of negative factors. It reinforces that school to prison pipeline. I remember years ago, there was a man called Martin Neri. He was uh, director general of the prison service and uh, he wasn't a sort of uh, liberal or anything like that. But he said, he said, and I quote, the day you exclude a child from school, you may as well book the date of their first court appearance. So what happens to children in schools? and their relationship with the criminal justice system in schools can set them, as I say, on this schools to prison pipeline. Now I've spoken to superintendents um, who I respect and they've said when they put police in schools, they try and put people in who are, you know, thoughtful and able to engage with young people and all the rest of it. Well, that's fine. But for me, I don't think police should be routinely in our schools at all. But again, I'm sure that's something um, you will be debating. So you've got policing, which we know, you know, all the history from, from uh, I first came into politics campaigning against a thing called the Suss Law, which was uh, an early version of Stop and Search. Um, we know that the black community as a whole and young black people in particular suffer from institutional race from the police force. We know as well that if you look at the outturns in education, whether it's the numbers of exclusions, whether it's the actual results that black children, particularly black boys are getting, there's institutional discrimination going on there too. Now, 
We all know that black and brown children are in school and achieving, but it's also the case that if you look at the statistics, you see a pattern of low achievement and underachievement. And that there are other issues that are raised by this case, see what's happening with immigration, housing, and healthcare. These are all issues which condition how our children see themselves and how the society sees them. So how do we safeguard black and brown children in Britain schools? As I said earlier, we have to listen to them. We have to listen to their families. We have to listen to black and brown communities. And, you know, these are not new issues. All of the issues that I've touched on this morning or this afternoon, all of the issues I've touched on about institutional racism and policing and education are issues which go back decades, which issue, they're issues which go back generations. So can we not at last start to listen to the children, listen to the community and make it possible going forward for black and brown children to have the same expectation of safeguarding as white children and for black and brown children to be able to achieve all that they're capable of. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you for providing such a good context and starting to speak about some of the, the difficulties that exist and not avoiding the topic or avoiding the conversation. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on now to our next speaker. Again, as I said earlier, um, we selected specific people, specific interest in, in this um, topic, but also expertise. So what we wanted to bring together were people um, who were leaders in their field in the different aspects. So we're looking at health, we're looking at education, we're looking at the police. So the next lady that I'm going to introduce is none other than Rosemary Campbell Stevens, MBE. As she's an educator and an activist. I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing what Rosemary is going to bring to this conversation. So can I hand over to you, please, Rosemary? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Denise. And um, thank you, Diane, um, my friend, and Arlene for that very beautiful and um, powerful opening to this very important conference. Um, I will start as Arlene did by taking my seat at the table as a um, black African woman um, of Caribbean heritage and Jamaican parentage specifically. I am joining you from my home in Jamaica, um, which is on plantation land. Next door is my sister and in her um, front garden is the um, gravestone of the slave owners that would have owned our ancestors on this land. So as both Arlene and um, Diane has said, um, this is not a theoretical exercise for me um, speaking about this issue. And um, I've been given the, the title um, uh, how can African and Caribbean children be safeguarded? And I will be talking from the um, perspective of an educationalist. So let me begin to share screen now, and I hope that people can see um, my presentation. We can. So I have taken my seat at the table, and I know that all of you have, the hundreds of people that are on this call, and I suppose one of the things that we should be agreeing is that the only way that African and Caribbean children can be safeguarded is if we who take our seats at the table take on our responsibility to safeguard our own children and not to leave our children in the hands of a system that as we um, know, uh, and we all know what time it is in 2022 in the UK for black people. Um, 
it is time for us to take the responsibility for safeguarding our own children. And for those white allies who have sufficiently evolved in terms of us being on the same playing field as regards what we consider it is to be human, um, then we can work together in terms of ensuring that the dehumanization of black people that extends to our children will stop. And so part of what I do in 2022, as we are used to pronouns now as um, uh, 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 addition to our names, is to use my pronoun, which is we, us. I've always operated from a we, us mentality. Um, there is no I without we. Um, I am connected to, to everybody on this call, on this conference, and I am connected to other people on this planet Earth. And so I move in a we, us orientation. And I'm suggesting to you that one of the ways that we can safeguard our children is to move to a we, us orientation. Those teachers could not have called the police into school to violate child Q if they had seen her as their child. Education, I'm an educationalist. I love education. Um, I've worked in education all of my life. And one of the things that I would say to educators is that we cannot be naive about the system of which we are a part. We need to understand the roots of that system. We need to understand the purpose of how the, and why that system was set up. And we also need to understand the current impact. I'll talk about the roots a little later on, but I think any teacher and any educator who is under the illusion that the schooling system that we have masquerading as an education system is there to educate anybody is it really needs to read some books. The purpose of the state education system in the UK, sadly, has been reduced to its original purpose which is a utilitarian tool to ensure that we have, that you have in the UK, a barely educated, barely literate, compliant and quiet workforce to service the capitalist machine. It really is as simple as that. And you don't need to take Rosemary Campbell Stevens word for it. You can look up the roots of um, the education system, the British education system, and see what it was set up to do when, we, when Britain moved from being a largely agricultural society towards being an industrialized one. They needed a system of ensuring that there was basic education for a workforce. When you have a system that is, has those kinds of roots, you have to dig deep to find any kind of human purpose within an education system that moves beyond those utilitarian roots. And what you will find within the education system that is not only in Britain, we're talking about African and African Caribbean children, so when we look at those countries in Africa that were colonized by the Europeans and those of countries in Africa that were colonized by Britain, and when you look at the Caribbean and the education system that has been left in place by the colonizers for the British and English speaking islands, then you will find that in the UK system, and in those systems, the education systems in Africa, and in the systems out here in Jamaica and across the Caribbean, that systemic racism is baked into those systems. And part of the way that those systems operate in a systemically racist way is to dehumanize us, whether we are on African soil 
British soil or Jamaican soil. We have to get to the root of the systems that we have inherited. I'm talking about education. There are police, there are social workers, there are all kinds of other professionals on this call. Look at the roots of your systems, they're no different. So what's missing from our education system? Moral purpose. That's why, as Arlene has pointed out, as Diana has pointed out, the police did not break any laws because the laws are just as systemically racist as the practice that emanates from those laws. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral or ethical. And of course, the way that we can trace back the roots to those laws is to the slave codes that people have made implicit reference to and Arlene made a specific reference to. So the first time that we were dehumanized as property was in the slave codes in 1661 in Barbados. And then those laws were um, reviewed and strengthened in 1664 in Jamaica. So the first time that whiteness now um, has a hierarchy, is in a hierarchy above black people and black African people are turned into property are in those slave code laws. Look them up. So what does our focus need to be? There needs to be collective action. And we, us as African Caribbean communities, and we, us as African and Caribbean professionals need to understand that irrespective of our training and irrespective of uh, the laws, we need to be collectively looking at how we police ourselves, hold to account those people who we have elected to represent us and ensure like any other community would, like you would as a mother or father of your own children, ensure that you protect and safeguard and hold to account anybody and any system that violates them. And part of the way that we need that is to move from an ethnic minority, very glad that Diane and others have been using global majority. Um, we're not ethnic minorities. Part of the way that we're colonized into behaving in the way that we do is to be wrongly defined as ethnic minorities. It's part of the racialization process. It's part of the dehumanization process and it's part of the minoritization process. When we operate like a global majority, then we understand that we can go, even though Brexit has happened, Chao Q can go to the European Court of Human Rights. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. So let's move towards a we orientation and collective action. And let me move on very, very quickly. One of the many books that I have behind me on my shelf is the bell curve. And I'm suggesting to people that if they have not heard about the bell curve, that you buy it. Um, it's a big thick book, but you can jump into it. And it will clearly explain the eugenicist roots of the systems that we, in which we operate. Uh, it's important that we understand that the tree, and if we look at history, you know, um, Arlene talked about us looking at history. I think it's helpful to us to move away from looking at a linear line going backwards in time. And instead to look at history as part of the geological layers of the soil on which we all stand and sit. In that way, when we look at history as part of geological layers, we will see that they are, uh, history is forever with us. 
and the tree that is planted in that soil cannot bear different fruit to the ones that it was intended to bear. So if you look at my eugenics tree, you will see that all of the ologies, all genealogy, sociology, if we look at politics, if we look at law, if we look at geographic, ge geography, anthropology, archeology, span history of geology, genetics, psychology, they all come from those eugenicist roots. All the assessments that we use, all the ways that our training is um, uh, um, uh, encapsulated to have us see knowledge as neutral when in fact it is anything but. So let me be clear. Child Q was treated in the way that she was because this is how we are seen. And our history tells us this. I'm sitting on plantation land where my family are from, where my ancestors would have been enslaved and owned as property right on this land. As I said, the slave owner's um, gravestone is next door in my sister's garden. So actually, I know that the gag that was used on my ancestors to kill off our language would have been made in Birmingham, in the city where I grew up. It is a real, it, you know, it's, it's, part, it's a fact. And once you remove people's language, you remove their, um, their, their capacity to remember, you remove their culture and destroy their culture, you destroy their memory, and you erase their ways of knowing and being. And that was very intentional. June 16th, 1976, I was a 15 year old um, student sitting at home watching my television when I saw um, the Soweto riots taking place, the Soweto uprising taking place in Soweto, South Africa, where African students were um, demonstrating against a third rate Bantu education within their own country, within their own schools. I'm being taught in Afrikaans. That I, I decided on that day that I would be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher that was good enough to stand up beside students like this. You're asking me how do we need to safeguard African and Caribbean students. And at this point, I am talking to African and Caribbean people about how we need to re-educate ourselves about struggle and what it is that we need to do to ensure that we safeguard our own communities. So in spite of my beautiful education in Birmingham, at um, one of the prestigious grammar schools and then going on to a Russell Group University. In neither of those institutions did I learn anything about what it was to be an African person. And so I had to learn by going to um, the Black Book Fairs, um, the supplementary schools, the African Caribbean self-help organizations that were set up all across the UK in our global majority cities in the 1960s. That is where I learned about self. I am not sure where our black professionals learn about self today and understand what their history is, what their lineage is and what their role and purpose is. Here is a picture from um, a student's exercise book, one of my students um, at the Saturday school, I was at the same time teaching English in a mainstream secondary school. I'm, I'm a former English teacher. I'm a former Ofsted inspector. I've been a head teacher in British schools. I've been an advisor to the DFE for um, uh, 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 African Caribbean youngsters and setting up Aiming High. I've done research 
in the UK. And I, I set up the Investing in Diversity Leadership Program to get more Black and Asian teachers into London schools through the London Challenge from 2003 to 2011. And through my 40 years of working within mainstream, I have continued nonstop to work within our community. We have to have parallel tracks in order to truly safeguard our African and African Caribbean children. I'm not quite sure what 2022 black professionals feel about that, but I'm sharing how I have done this. And you can see that in 1983, we saw curriculum as well as pedagogy as autobiography. And I would suggest to you, as I'm talking about the education section, that whether we're looking at education in the early years, through primary, secondary, going on to college and university, there must be an, ele an, a, a, an element of any kind of education system where anybody that goes through that education system at least comes out with some knowledge of self. And if that is denied, then one of the things that we have to do is to provide it. So the other thing that I would say is that um, you will see that my telephone number is at the top of this child's um, exercise book and my first name, Rosemary. Again, this is a supplementary school. That was my home telephone number in Hansworth in Birmingham. Why did she need this? Because as Diane reminded us, um, police and interaction with the black community and with black children is not something that started with child Q. This is 1983. And as a conscious young black teacher, I understood that my role was to be in loco parentis so that when children were stopped and taken to um, the Thornhill Road, let's name it, Thornhill Road Police Station in Hansworth in Birmingham, or the Birmingham Massives will, uh, will remember where that is. I think it probably is still there when the children were taken there as they were, and they had their one phone call, they would phone their teacher at Saturday school, who would then phone their parents and phone the black lawyers that we worked with because black professionals were organized and connected. So let me move through very quickly. Build on the legacy. We're not starting from scratch. You're not starting from scratch. Here are two of the shoulders that I stand on, Elaine Foster Allen and Professor Gus John. Let's move beyond representation, just having us sit at the table. And what we need to do is to change what happens at that table from our perspective. And investing in diversity, as somebody has mentioned in the chat, and we will be doing some research this year, by the way, about the impact of investing in diversity. I think it's very important to do the research that researchers are doing around why black educators are leaving the profession. I think it's also important because certainly the white establishment will not do it. It's not in their interest to do so. For us to do the research to show the impact that black educators, black teachers, black leaders have made to have positively made to the education system. And that's about changing the heart of educational leadership. A global majority mindset moves beyond using the right language and stop calling ourselves ethnic minorities. It moves to having a paradigm shift that decenters whiteness and centers us. And at, at that paradigm shift, we always ask, irrespective of the policy, from whose perspective, in whose interest, who benefits and who does not, for what purpose and to what end. And if anybody had thought to even have those kinds of conversations about child Q, 
then we wouldn't be discussing the situation that we're discussing today. So let me move away from just talking to we us as black professionals and talk to everybody gathered in this space. Inclusion with us decentering whiteness and us taking our proper um, place at an inclusive table means that we create a new and a better space for all of us. Um, at some point, if it isn't in the chat already, I will, or Neil may well put in the link, I, I think it's done, to my book called Educational Leadership and the Global Majority. It's a very small pivot title, and it really looks at, um, it, there are six chapters, as you can say, as you can say, it, it talks about global majority decolonizing narratives. Chapter two is the big chapter that took me to a dark place because what that does is to outline the racialization process going way beyond slavery, by the way, um, how we were removed or reduced to the creation of a single narrative and the restoration of memory that needs to take place. And it's in there that you will see the sequence right from the Crusades through to the present day, um, uh, chronologically labeled how we have been dehumanized over time and, and why the 1661 and 1664 um, slave codes enshrined in British law are so important, were in in enshrined in British law now enshrined in the DNA of the way that we think and the way that we operate. And I say we, black and white people, because we're all subject to the same kind of training. I like chapter four because it talks about seven women, seven steps, and um, it tells a change story that happened in Birmingham, of which I am a part, that happened a few years ago because one of the things that we have to do is to stop reacting. And um, actually it's, it's difficult in the UK because we've, we're kind of in a constant state of having to defend our blackness and react to systemic racism instead of doing the work that we really need to do as our people. Um, so I like chapter four because it steps away from that reaction thing to what we ought to be doing. It's about culturally competent leadership in, in five, and it's about the global majority going back to the future, um, a possibility to live into. And really that book is about disrupting systemic colonialism, minoritization and racialization. It's about restoring our memory. The reason why child Q can happen is because we don't remember who we are. We don't remember how we need to operate. We don't um, remember um, what it is that uh, our purpose is um, as the divine um, bodies that we are. You know, the way that Arlene started the whole thing is because we as black people should know that we are spiritual, ancestral, tribal, physical, as well as intellectual and emotional human beings. That's what it is to be human. And when we're operating at that level, we will actually be vibrating at a much higher level than the way that the systemically racist systems have reduced us all, black and white people. And then we need to situate ourselves at the core of conversations without apology. We make up 85% of the world's population, the global majority. I don't know about you, but when my phone gets down to 15% battery life, I'm a little concerned. So why is it that we would be operating on 15% battery life in every aspect of our life by centering the 15% of the global minority who run things? Part of what we all need to do, white and black people is to heal. And we can only heal when we tell the truth when we take responsibility, when we give and we seek restitution, and we need a new way of being. So let me move on 
And let me just close so that I um, try and stick as far as I can to time. Um, the way that we safeguard African and Caribbean children is for us as African and Caribbean people to turn up in the world as ourselves. I understand that many of us are psychologically damaged. I understand that many of us are living with trauma. I understand that there are many of us who don't even understand any of what I've just said. But there are, there are enough of us who can still tap into who we are can still tap into who we are as human beings. And I would suggest to you that one of the things that we need to do is to stop focusing so much of our energy on reacting. We do need to stand up as a community when something like Child Q happens. What needs to happen is that the black professional associations within education, within social work, within psychology, within um, policing within law, the, the legal system, all of those black organizations need to stand up and be counted so that individuals don't have to stand up and be counted and picked off by the places that pay their, their salaries so that they can keep a roof over their head and their families. That's what time it is in 2022, black people. Let's organize and let our organizations speak for us and defend our communities. I take my responsibility as a junior elder to do that. And every last one of us must do that. And that way we are intentional and people don't ramp with us because they understand what time it is too. We need to identify critical safeguarding areas ourselves. We have enough knowledge and enough research and enough lived experience to know exactly what it is. And our children need to be trained to know exactly what it is if we're going to continue to put them into these killing fields that so many of these schools are. Not all, not all. I've loved working in education and I've loved with, I've lived and, and, and loved and worked in some fabulous institutions, but trust me, there are some places that operate in the way that Charles Q's school operated because they feel that they're untouchable and that we have no clout. Understand the damn system like we understand the tube system in London or any system that we're in. We don't just go into it naive. Understand the system. Anticipate the blockages. We know what they are. Avoid the distractions. We know what those are and the distractors, some of whom will look like us, by the way. After this lovely conference, wait for some Guardian headline to be coming out, not about the conference, but about some other distracting feature. And it will usually be written by some black or brown person. You know the, you know the drill. Educate and train our people. And that's what we need to do um, ourselves. We should be running our own training for our own teachers about how they navigate the system, how they navigate a dehumanized system, how they decolonize the education system. Whilst working within the system, we need to take control of that. Recalibrate where necessary, create safe passage through, build the parallel track, which means reimagining our supplementary schools for the new modern age, take collective action, and for God's sake, understand that we are not just regional, but global people. It, was a, we, it is been an honor to speak at this conference. I really want to thank Arlene and her team, her fabulous team for putting this conference on um, at such an important time. And it's my pleasure to be joining you here from my home in Hanover, Jamaica, albeit on plantation land. At night, I feel them. I feel them dancing, Arlene, that we are, not only we own the land, 
We managed to get our title um, after many, many years. That's another issue in terms of the colonial legacy and who owns land out here and all of that, but we'll fight it to the last breath. And it is with great joy that I participate in this today, giving thanks to my ancestors and honoring them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosemary. That was, um, I have no words. Um, thank you for touching on some of the key important contextual, cultural, ancestral things that we don't get to hear often enough because we're so busy in the system just working and working and working. Thank you for raising the issues about us taking responsibility for our children, the community aspect. You've touched on so many things. I wish I had an audience with you, um, just by myself, by the way. Um, we've still got so many great speakers to come through and you'll all have an opportunity this afternoon um, for the panel discussion. There are so many things that we want to continue to discuss and to bring to the forefront and to continue to have, I'm really enjoying the, ch the challenging things I'm hearing and we need to be able to hear it without impersonalizing it or thinking it's a hit or thinking that, you know, you we're, we're attacking white people. No, it's not about that. We just wanna come alongside and just bring everything to the forefront. Okay, let me carry on now. So our next speaker panelist, is again our very own Jacqueline Say, who is a specialist nurse and does so many other things. So I'm going to hand you over. I'm really excited to have you here, Jacqueline, and I'm really looking forward to hearing something from a health perspective. So over to you, Jacqueline. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Weeks and team. I don't know how I'm going to follow you, Rosemary. <laughs> There's such an inspirational, yeah, absolutely, I, yeah, just brilliant. But, but I, um, I've, uh, I want to start by reading something that um, was written by Dr. Kadush about uh, almost a year ago today, and it, uh, an article he wrote um, in the Spectator, and he's and it said recently published figures from the government's racial disparity unit are very concerning. Black children make up 5% of the general population, but 8% of children in care. People adopted black children at an alarmingly low rate. Only 2% of adoptions in 2019 were of black children, and black children are far more likely to remain in the care system. And then he goes on to say about care leavers make up 25% of the homeless population in England. Nearly a quarter of adult prison population have been in care. Um, and care leavers aged between 19 and 21 are three times more likely to be out of education, employment and training compared to 39%. Um, so 39% compared to the 13% of, of children that weren't in the care system. Now, I left care over 40 years ago now um, and went, moved straight into the nursing home. Um, and- Sorry, sorry, Jacqueline, we've got a couple of sound issues um, with you. I'm not sure if, whether it's the laptop that's moving, but um, sorry to disturb you. Better? Uh, no, it's still, there's, still, there's a bit of fuzzing going on. Oh, that's better. That's better. Yeah, that's we, better. That's better. Sorry. Yeah. Do I need to repeat anything? Uh, the last bit, if that's the case. All right. So, yeah, so I left the care system about 40 years ago and to move into the nurses home. Um, and in lots of ways, things haven't changed for children of African and African Caribbean heritage at all. Um, the, the outcomes are, are just as bad as, as they were in lots of ways. Um, I agree that as um, we ourselves need to start, start taking more responsibility, being more vocal, um, be more on uh, hands-on rather than depending on other people. And if I think for myself as well now, need to stop being bothered when people, you know, the stereotypes, we're aggressive, you're this, you're that, if you're passionate about what you're, you're speaking or, or, your, or your concerns. So, um, at the moment, I'm working as a nurse for children in care. I've also worked as a midwife and I could go, there could be a seminar just alone on 
the, the treatment of, of black women in the maternity um, units. Um, but today I'm going to look at looked after children. So as, as a nurse for looked after children, we're one of their corporate parents. So and what, what we're the, the what we're meant to do is to try and make sure that children have the same health um, health outcomes as the rest of the population do. So we and it's easy to do, and it can almost become a tick box. Oh, have they been to the dentist? Have they been to the GP? Um, have they been to the optician? All those things. What very often is missed, and our, our assessment is um, quite a comprehensive, holistic assessment, but what very often gets missed is the emotional health and well-being of, of children. So where I work, we have a schedule of growing skills um, tool that looks at emotional well-being. But with children of, of African and African Caribbean heritage, there's so much other baggage, as Rosemary said, that they've got from either adults, and it could have been their birth family, or from other uh, foster carers, or from the whole system. So, and what we're finding now is that when you speak to children about their emotional well-being, there's a big issue around colorism, um, their hair, um, believing that um, they, they are too loud or, or that black children have got to be a certain type. And if you don't fit into that narrative, then you're not really black or you've got to fit into that narrative. So the rest of society will accept you. And it's really, really difficult trying to, because for, for the children, we see the under fives once a year for this lack health assessment and the over fives sorry the under fives twice a year and the over fives once a year so any and the assessment takes about an hour an hour and a bit depending on how much the young person wants to speak to you it's very difficult in just that short time to try and get you know over to them to to have some pride in themselves as a black person and you know what rich heritage they have because lots of them do not know that at all i can give an example of one of my children is adopted when um, uh, when we was getting um, to know him and meet him, we found out that we were the only family that had come forward in the whole of the United Kingdom to adopt him. What's that about? There's enough of us. Why aren't we thinking we've got children in this? You know, we can do something about that. So we were the only ones that came forward. When he first came to to stay with us, he had been told that because he's fairer skinned that he was peach, and made to. to to feel um, that he could almost be like um, an honorary white person and which was better for him because his skin was peach. And I can remember my daughter going hysterical, saying, mommy, mommy, tell him he's not peach, you're black. You know, you're... And he said, no, 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 I am, I'm peach. And he really wanted to be peach. So many of the children that we speak to um, when you're doing the assessment feel, feel because of the colorism, feel that they are better because they've got fairer skin perhaps, or that they're not kind of really black. Um, and when you try and explain to them that that's something inherited from slavery and you know it was a divide and conquer thing, children haven't got a clue that that's, you know, that ever existed. So the, the emotional well-being of our children, um, their self-esteem, it can be very, very low and they expect, well, they expect nothing, some of them, um, and so the nothing is um, what they get. So, like, as I said, it's we, with the the you know the, the 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 physical health that's fine, but the emotional health and well being, the self esteem, the little talks that you might have with if you've got a son about what to do if the police stop you, all these things get can get missed, and and it's it's very dependent on. Um, who the carer might be or the social worker. So it varies from very area to area. So some places people um, were, are, are very strong on that. And you know that the kids will know their rights and they'll be you know, firm in their heritage. Other children, it, it's, it's kind of non-existent. And when you try to raise it, it's you're the big bad wolf. You've got the chip on your shoulder. You're making problems where they don't exist. And you really have to be kind of assertive <laughs> although it's changed that you're aggressive, always got something to say, 
um, or being troublesome. And even as, as a, an adult, sometimes you think, shall I speak now or do I keep quiet? But no, you've always got to think of, you know, if I think when I was in the care, this is in the care system, many moons ago, I can still feel, you know, that feeling when you're so vulnerable because your voice is not being heard. So one of the parts of our health assessment is that we want to hear the voice of the child. It's not just a tick box exercise. So yes, we know where they went to the dentist, the opticians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to know who you are as a person, what you like, what you like to do, what are your hobbies? Um, are you engaging in any hobbies? If not, why not? Um, another thing with my son was that um, when uh, we met the social worker and she's speaking to my children, the other children, and the social worker said, oh, no, no, I, I know him really, really well. Um, uh, I've been a social worker for a long time. I really know him well. So, and I think what I know now, what she meant was that she knew all his history, but him as a person, she didn't know well. So my daughter, who was nine at the time said, oh, what's his favorite television program? I don't know. What's his favorite color? I don't know. What book is it? And she didn't know because she didn't know him as a, as a person. So, you know, we can all tick, we've done this, yeah, they've, they've gone to the dentist, they, but we don't know them as a person. Um, and we don't know who their, their friends are. Have they got friends? Um, are they getting bullied? So there's lots of things that go on with our children. And, and these are most, the, the, they're in a vulnerable group already. And then there's this extra vulnerability because of the color of their skin. So, um, so we, as much as possible, we try to see the children on their own, even if it's for a few minutes while we're doing their height and weight. And that's because they need their own space to be able to, to say something, you know, um, and even if it's just to have a moan and a debrief about um, the social worker, the, the foster care, a school or whatever. Um, so as much as possible, we try and speak to the children um, on their own. Again, you can get lots out of the kids when they are on their own. Um, we also ask them, um, if they had free wishes or what's good about wherever they live, where they're living, whether it being um, uh, a foster placement, a residential unit, even with um, family and friends. And lots of times children will say everything's hunky dory. Oh, I score it nine out of 10, 10 being the maximum. Why do you score it nine out of 10? Uh, oh, I don't know. All right. Tell me one good thing about being there. And, and very often the children can't say or they just say what they think you as an adult wants to hear. So it's very important if we really want to hear from children and their voice and what's going on, that we word the questions so that we can get the information from them. Um, so that's something we try to do. We also um, look back at all the previous assessments. So, and this becomes a, a real good tool as the children get older and they don't want to see us. So they vote with their feet. Oh, I'm not ill. I don't need to, I don't want to see you. If you can sweet talk them, I oh, remember a couple of years ago when you used to draw me those lovely pictures of unicorns and you can kind of, because of that continuity, you can sweet talk them into coming and seeing you because when they don't want to come and see you, um, that's the very time when we want to see them because we want to know what's going on. Um, what's also good is that because we see them six monthly or a year and we look at previous assessments and we get information from all the other health, anything to do with their health, including from school, we can get this real rounded picture. And sometimes we're the, the only team that kind of gets that full picture to, to pass on to social care, to feed into their overall care plan and their, their reviews. Um, so, um, and as I've said, with the, the, the continuity and seeing children, very often if they move out of area and you, you know still children uh, kind of, and depending on where they, 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 they live, some areas are better than others, you still get children um, moving placements, several placements sometimes, um, not only, um, and they could be a transracial case, placement, but they could be placements that are completely different. You know, one family could be um, an Asian Muslim family, then they move to a white Irish family, and then, and, and no one's given any thought to how that's affecting their emotional well-being and, and whether they fit in and, and, and how they, they um, feel and stuff. And I can think of one child that had moved several placements and we'd done her weight one year, and then we saw her a year later and she'd gained four stone. 
but because of all the different changes of schools and placements, nobody had seen that. And then all they could say is because she was a black child, it was, oh, but she's just big built. Lots of black people are big built. You still hear these old stripe real dad and, and you think it's disappeared and, and, it, and it hasn't, it's there, you hear it all the time. Um, or that uh, if you ask about activities out of school, oh, they don't want to go, what have you offered them? Um, uh, well, black children can't swim or they don't wanna go because of their hair. Well, they might not wanna go for their hair, but did you ask them that? Or did you try and get a cap that would cover their hair and keep it dry? You know, there's, there's little, little things like this. So the whole time that the children are still being um, kind of disadvantaged. And I think like Rosemary so eloquently said, is it sometimes it comes from ourselves as well. Because we kind of believe some of these nonsense stereotypes and we feed them to the children. And the, these are people that are supposed to kind of have some savvy about them and they're passing nonsense um, onto the children. So um, it's a statutory requirement. And so we, um, we, and we get, um, we have to report back why we breach. Um, in our service, the, the child is more important. And so if they don't want to be seen at a certain time for whatever reason, um, because they don't want to miss, we try and see as much as possible children outside of school so they don't miss school. Um, but if it breaches, we just say why it's breached because it was in the child's best interest. So if they want to be seen in the in the school holidays because um, uh, they go to activities after school or they're in the football team or whatever, um, we go along with that. So for, for where I work, we're fortunate that the child is more important um, than the little tip box to say that they've been seen. Um, the, the 15 pluses are the more difficult to engage um, because like I said, they get to the age where they decide that they're gonna vote with their feet. The other issue we have is that anyone, any child that's black, they're seen as a homogenous group with all the same needs. They're not seen as an individual that needs a bespoke service like everybody else. And so a child born in this country um, and a, a refugee child with different health needs, they're all kind of seen um, as the same unless you open your mouth and say something and um, sometimes have to face the wrath of trying to say, you know, we, we just like everybody else, we can be quiet, we can be loud, we can be this, we can be that. You know, we are different. We are diverse within ourselves. The other thing you, you kind of, um, and some of the children believe this as, as well. If you think in England, that North and South, Northerners don't like Southerners and vice versa, but suddenly Africa becomes a country. And the amount of people that think that everyone from Africa does the same things as the same food, um, the same with the Caribbean. And if you try to talk to some people about um, how you, um, how are you embracing the child's um, uh, heritage? What are you doing? And, and it'll be something silly like, I don't know, I, I, I bought some, got some jollof rice. <laughs> And, and then they think, oh, they've ticked that box. And, you know, my daughter's away at uni and she said that, and it's a predominantly white uni. And she said when she first got there, she'd walk into the kitchen and they'd start playing reggae music because she's black, she must like reggae music. But that still kind of happens within health and social care, you know? So we can be good at sports, but not necessarily academic. We could be good at this, but not the scientists. Um, and again, going back to Rosemary, sometimes that's coming from ourselves as well. And that's the, 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 the really most tragic part that people can't emancipate themselves from that mental slavery, you know? Um, so, but with, with the, 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 lack, the, the health reviews, it's supposed to be an, an extra safety net. Um, and as I said, it's a comprehensive assessment, um, uh, looking at the whole child and all aspects of the child, but I still feel that the emotional health and well-being isn't as stressed as it, as it could be. And that the voice of children still really isn't heard. Um, and as I said, you know, all these years along the line um, from when I left the system and things in lots of ways haven't improved. In lots of ways, the, the, the racism and that is more um, covert, it's still going on, but it's done with, with a smile, or it'll be silly things like, oh, they couldn't see that the, 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 oh, you hear comments still like, 
oh, I couldn't see his vein to take blood because the skin's dark. Well, there's all different shades of, of black skin. So it wasn't, you know, and if you can take blood, you can take blood. And then, and it's silly little comments like that, that go into our children's minds. And then they start thinking, oh, you know, that there's something really different about them that's bad. Um, so, uh, I don't know what else I can say, except that um, things really haven't moved on and meetings like, you know, conferences like this are just so needed and that we, as a people need to start doing things. Sorry, is that, have I cut off? Can you hear me? I've got a sign yeah. saying it's gone mute. It nearly oh, came to the end. Oh, right. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, that uh, we need to start doing things um, for, for, for ourselves. Um, and that, you know, people going, oh, but there's not enough role. There's more than enough more role models. We're probably the, the, the group that's got the most role models. Um, it's about us now being active um, for our children and empowering our children. And again, I'm sorry, Rosemary, I think you're brilliant. You know, letting our children know what a rich heritage they are and all the things that they've been made to feel were, were inferior. There's something to be celebrated. Um, but I think the, the, the emotional well-being and the self-esteem of, of our children, that's what we need to, to be targeting now. Sorry, I know I've got a quick, I speak very quickly around Cockney, but <laughs> I hope you could all hear. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for bringing such a strong um, practice perspective to the discussion and to the, to the conversation and for highlighting that these issues still continue mm. we're still subject to stereotypes you know that that it, it's just been perpetuated mm. so um, I'm hoping that we can discuss some of these things a little bit later on in in the the panel discussion so just to move on um, swiftly to our next panelist um, I'm going to hand you over again to our very own Chantel Thomas who is the anti-racism lead for the British Association of Social Workers, also known as BASWA. Thank you, Chantelle, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Denise. Um, and thank you, Arlene, for inviting me. Um, and everyone can hear me, is that right? Good, good, good. Okay, yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, and just to say, um, Diane and um, Rosemary, yeah, I'm in awe, you know, all what you said, you know, it, it speaks to everything, um, you know, that I'm thinking and feeling, and I'm just hoping I can, I can follow your lead, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, right. Let me... So as I mentioned, I'm going to be speaking from a social work perspective, and I'm going to do as you guys did as well and position myself at this table. Um, I am a Black African Caribbean woman. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a social worker, I'm an educator. And I was disgusted, horrified, angry, all the you know negative uh, emotions you could experience um, by what happened to Child Q, um, but I wasn't surprised. Um, Child Q suffered at the hands at, of, of those people that were tasked to safeguard her. You know, I know we've mentioned it. I'm not going to go back into all the details of that. Racism and sexism are two of the isms predominantly that affect me as a black woman. And obviously this was, you know, two of the biggest isms that played uh, the role in the decision making um, of what was allowed to happen. And as we heard, it was there was no laws broken, um, but this is what was allowed to happen um, for Child Q. Um, and I want us to start thinking about, you know, what that means for the system, the social system, the diseases that these two isms actually uh, uh, um, speak to. And what we saw played out, you know, in the decision, you know, the decision that was made to strip search um, this child. What does that mean for us as, 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 as a system, as the police, as the education, but also what does that mean for social workers? Um, adultification, you know, as I mentioned, uh, well, as, as you know, has kind of come to the fore um, in, in this discussion is racism, you know, let's not let's not dress it up it's it's racism, you know, stripped down to the core. Um, and, it, you know, it was noted as the factor, you know, um, in, 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 this, in this situation as well. And it's when, you know, as we've heard before, it's when uh, our children are seen as, as less than, they're not seen as children, so therefore they're not afforded the inherent safeguards and protections that they would if they were white. But let's not get it twisted, you know, this isn't about one child in one school, as we've heard, you know, this is about a systemic 
um, inherent institutional problem um, that goes way back, you know, to some of the, you know, the acts and, and the, the codes, you know, that we heard um, Rosemary talking about um, as well. Um, and as I said, it speaks to the systemic problems in the UK and also in, in social work as, as a profession uh, um, um, as well. So yeah, so as I mentioned, what adultification means is, is the evaluation of, of, of mature based on maturity as opposed to the presumption of major, majority, um, mature, maturity, I can't say the word, and it has a harmful impact um, on the child. So what does adultification have to do with social work? Um, so I've, I've termed this um, um, anti-social and anti-racist safeguarding. And what Abraham X. Kindy talks about is the heartbeat of anti-racism is looking at self-reflection. And we've spoken about that. Some people have, have, have talked about that already. Um, the self-reflection, the looking inwards, you know, whether we're black or white, we have to look at that self-reflection, the recognition, the admission, and the fundamental self-critique um, of, of our own biases and our own thought processes. Safeguarding children has, has, has been defined in working together um, to protect children from maltreatment. And we've heard about, you know, if what happened to child Q was to, was, was to have happened or was to have been conducted or perpetrated by a parent, it will be a whole different conversation and a whole different discussion that we'll be having. As a profession, you know, we have two choices. Um, we're either racist or, 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 or anti-racist. There's none of this middle ground of being non-racist, because if you're non-racist, that basically means, you know, you're neutral and you're just a, just a mask for racism. Um, what's also been discussed is, is before we can even start to tackle racism is to understand how race, racism began. And we, we heard of that, you know, the social construction of whiteness that went back to slavery, which protected the upper class, class white colonialists um, from being enslaved. You know, it protected them from, you know, from, from being classed as property, as chattel, as objects, as things, um, as we were, you know, in, in the slave codes. So I'm just going to throw out some books. Rene Eddy Lodge talks about why, 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 why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. Again, to help, you know, those of us black and white, you know, that need to do some work around what that means and how, how we can overcome um, um, that mindset. You know, we heard about the global majority mindset. That's the mindset we need to start to walk into and start to talk about. Dismantling systems that perpetrate, perpetrate racism shouldn't be left to black people alone. It shouldn't be left to the global majority. It's a whiteness problem. It's not a blackness problem. And I think it's about redressing that balance as well. Education has been spoken about um, quite strongly about how um, we, we need to look at um, 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 educating, you know, um, police, uh, 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 um, teachers, but also social workers. And that's why myself and a colleague have kind of devised uh, and developed uh, and deliver um, a, a social work course that's specifically for social workers. It's an anti-racism course, sorry, um, specifically uh, uh, for social workers. And it holds relationship-based anti-racist practice at the heart. Um, and it's about uh, achieving emotional intelligence, that critical reflective space, as well as curious conversations that we've heard um, that needs to happen um, as well. And of course, we can't just talk, but we have to start to, to, to unpick the language and, um, um, and help people to feel more comfortable in those spaces as well. It's also about uh, identifying our position, and we've spoke about that earlier as well. Um, and the, in relation to power, white privilege and black um, uh, empowerment, um, and develop our own kind of way, collective approach to dealing with protecting our own and safeguarding our own children. Um, despite our value base that social work being uh, um, around anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive, anti-racist practice, we've still a very long way to go in social work um, into becoming an anti-racist uh, um, um, and workforce. So, so some top tips of practitioners uh, as well, because you know what we're talking about here is um, um, how can African and black children uh, uh, be safeguarded? What is it we can do from a social work perspective in order to uh, help that to happen or to make sure, ensure that happens? And as I mentioned, it starts from yourself. It starts with that acknowledgement um, that discrimination is, is rife, you know, that we all have biases, no matter what color our skin, skin is. Um, and it's about understanding that and bringing that to the fore, to the fore um, so that they can be challenged. It's about having more curious conversations, as I mentioned, um, and thinking about whose voices are being amplified and whose are not. You know, what, what, what is the, what's the narrative that's been fed to us? Why is that? And we've heard, you know, a lot of that, uh, um, you know, being, you know, really, really um, richly explained by those that have gone before me. 
let's look at our personal circles. I think it's important as professionals, as parents, as practitioners, you know, what does our um, personal circles look like? Do people around us help us to help to challenge our, our thinking? Um, do they help us be more reflective? Are they help us be more dynamic? Um, because if everybody around us looks like us, if everybody around us thinks like how we do, how are we then going to be able to challenge ourselves when we see, you know, the, the lady walking down the road and she grabs a, a, a handbag? How can we challenge that? You know, when we see things happen in our schools, how do we challenge, you know? when we have those conversations around the dinner tables you know when it's quiet in our own in our personal spaces how do we challenge if everybody thinks and feels the same way we do we heard about language and i think um the lady just before me jacqueline um spoke about you know um all black people being classed as one as one homogenous group so the term bame that acronym please don't use that acronym look at the person in front of you really um it's important to understand who is sat before you um, and and ask them how they define themselves. You know, what's their culture? What's their identity? And the phrase that I love to use is BAME is lame. Don't use BAME. Um, also remember that BAME is also a term that is used to categorize, you know, for data purposes um, and to, uh, you know, help, um, you know, uh, disaggregate data. But what it doesn't do um, is, is it doesn't, um, look at the person behind it, you know, the term, um, and it doesn't translate well into people's personal life experiences uh, as well. So as I said, look at the person, you know, behind, you know, the, the, the term, the name as well. Um, as practitioners, reflective supervision, you know, I have colleagues, you know, uh, uh, around the Tavistock um, and elsewhere that are looking at anti-racist supervision, you know, where we're bringing these conversations, you know, uh, about what's going on, you know, in, 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 in our assessments, in the homes that we're going to visit, as well as what's going on within the organisation and the team that we're having. So we're able to ask the questions, you know, identify the gaps in knowledge and then um, understand how that impacts decision making, um, uh, you know, when we see, you know, a black dad trying to uh, fight for his child, you know, he doesn't want it just to get a, a council flat or for his immigration status, he may generally want to uh, uh, look after his child, but it's about, you know, breaking down those narratives and, you know, um, um, really understanding what, what, what that's about. But as I, as I mentioned, you know, education and exploring um, experience of others, people that don't look like you, people that don't think like you, people who have a different narrative or a different um, historical upbringing than what you have, but also looking at yourself as a white person, you know, uh, um, what does what does race mean to you? You know, as a black person, we often have to challenge, navigate these fields, um, or these fears, you know, from a quite an early age. As a white person, sometimes it's not, you know, or well, most of the time, you know, from my experience, it's not something you have to do growing up you know and only when you you know enter a specific space or you know you're, you're, you're forced to kind of challenge yourself that it then becomes an issue for you to do um, and for you to look at but it's important to understand that that history um, and as I said that's been mentioned before in terms of leaders and organizations as, uh, and organizational uh, uh, structures as well as I mentioned high quality proper training around um, anti-racism um, is really really important and not the generic EDI stuff that ticks the box that you do on screen um, and then and, and you know so people can pass their probation it has to be something that helps people to reflect it has to be some sort of uh, work that helps people to really understand um, you know their position where they're coming from and how you know, bring into the to the fore those uh, um, uh, biases that you know that that we have that we may not have have had a chance to to kind of to, to challenge um, as well. Ensuring that workforce, and I think that's mentioned, you know, um, teachers that look like the children that we serve, I think Diane mentioned that, but, you know, social workers, managers, leaders, directors, you know, um, um, being representative of the community that, that, that we're served. We've heard about the stats of about children on child protection plans, um, the disproportionate number of children, you know, in, in, in the care system, police, education, all the different um, um, uh, departments uh, across, the, across, the, across, across the country, you know, we, we will see disproportionate number of black children in the bottom range uh, uh, of things. What is that about? You know, until we have people in positions um, who can make the decisions, who can change the policies that look like the people that they're representing, this isn't going to change. And that goes back again to that collective activism that, you know, it takes us, it takes us as a, as a Black and global majority community um, to take back the reins and take back um, that responsibility as well. Um, establish, I talked about championing uncomfortable conversations. Again, that goes from, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, director level, you know, manager levels, you know, practitioners, students, um, newly qualified, it goes across the spectrum of social work. And uh, until we're able to, to, to have, you know, say the word black without, you know, looking around and thinking someone's going to come and, you know, you know, think it's a swear word, um, it's, it's important that, you know, it, these conversations become normalized you know um it, it, i you know my utopia will be to not have you know not to need these conversations not to need these spaces but unfortunately you know we're way uh, you know far away from from where we need to be um but i am uh, glad that we, we, we're able to have these conversations in this space um there's uh, you know as we heard there's many that's gone way before me who have been doing this work and there's still more you know i still stand on the shoulders of giants and some of them um are, are in this room um um today as well review your services you know look this is for managers look at you know uh, what black what black and global majority children are saying black girls and boys um, and how they're being referred to and what kind of uh, uh, support service we have that that's that that that's that helps them you know to, to, to kind of navigate these spaces um, as well um, policy leads senior managers directors um, representatives of community um, everybody needs training everybody needs to be on the same page and understand um, um, you know what what that means you know as I mentioned you know adultification um, the dehumanizing uh, dehumanizing nature of, of how our black children are are, are being um, are being treated you know all starts starts with racism so quickly just to summarize um, it starts with self um, acknowledge the fact that racism exists um, as I mentioned, and also looking at that work and looking at the part we play. What you know, what's our position? Where where do we stand on on, on that spectrum? And 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 really um, um, looking into that um, as well. Um, and making sure that we're committed, you know, making sure we're committed as social workers to, to this journey, you know, um, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's about becoming an anti-racist practitioner, becoming an anti-racist leader. And that word becoming means it's a journey. That word becoming means that it's not a one size um, uh, or one trick you know, one tick box exercise and it's and it's over. It does mean one has to be continuous, one has to be consistent, one has to be intentional about what, you know, what, what it is, you know, we want to do and the changes we want to make in our society. We have to do this together. We can't do this on our own. It takes it takes a village um, um, to range, raise, raise a child. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Chantal, thank you so much for bringing in, a, a, again, a very practice, focus, direction, and given us ideas of how we take this forward, which is what I think a lot of people will be asking, well, what do we do now? What next? What can we do to change things? And I really like, you know, you sort of mentioned training and things like that, which we'll hopefully pick up on in the, in, in the panel discussion. I think one of the key things that, you know, you were talking and you made me think of a colleague of mine that, would, that, that I previously worked with that said to me, not everything is about not everything is about race but actually today i am learning it is. everything is about race everything <laughs> is about race so it's 100%. really important that we continue to have these conversations i'm so excited i'm going to introduce our next speaker now because i can't wait for the panel discussion because we've got <laughs> some really good questions we're going to pose um, that i'm sure everybody wants to hear the response to so i'm going to hand over to um ade Salering. he's an he's the lead inspector at the national child protection and joint inspectorate um i'd also like to add that he's also the director and co-founder of an organization called kajiji uh which supports black safeguarding professionals thank you for joining us ade um, and thank you for representing the perspective of the police, because I think this is a key agency that I think a lot of people are going to want to hear from. So I'll hand over to you, Ade. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hope everyone can hear me. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ade Ade Solarin. I am a co founder and director of, of Kijiji, and, and Chantel mentioned it uh, as she closed. Um, it takes a village to raise a child, and Kijiji is Swahili for village. Uh, and Kijiji, the organization, actually was founded uh, because, essentially, because we wanted to bring um, African, Caribbean, Black safeguarding professionals uh, uh, together. Uh, I also um, I'm joining you today from uh, sunny and warm and humid Nigeria. So um, I'm hoping that I'll have zero interruptions. We had Rosemary from Jamaica. I'm, I'm currently in 
Nigeria. Uh, my co-founding director, Laurel Brown, she's on the call as well. Um, uh, we founded Kijiji about a couple of years ago uh, now. Uh, but my day job, my day job is um, I work for uh, Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire Rescue Services, HMICFRS. Uh, I am an inspection lead or lead inspector uh, in our child protection team. So I lead a team of um, specialist uh, child abuse detectives uh, who uh, we go out to each, any force in England and Wales and we inspect that force. The entire police forces child protection arrangements. Um, and, and then it's my role to kind of coordinate all the findings, do all the analysis, uh, and then put together a, a report. Um, I'm also, uh, uh, I've been doing that for a couple of years now, so I'm quite passionate, uh, as Denise already mentioned, about uh, child protection uh, and safeguarding. Uh, and I'm also, uh, the, the Home Secretary has commissioned uh, a new, uh, requested a new inspection, which is gonna be looking at child se sexual um, uh, exploitation, CSE, group-based CSE, and I'll be leading that inspection uh, 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 this this year. Um, and, and there's more details if you want to know about that particular commission, uh, it's it's going to be in the chat. I'm also a, a, a police officer, so I'm a special constable with the City of London Police. So um, any any perspective, like any policing perspective I give will be based on my experience as uh, a warranted police officer. Um, uh, 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 joined together with my previous experience, uh, uh, as well as my current experience as inspection lead, what I see when I go out um, with forces. So I'll be giving the policing uh, uh, angle uh, uh, today, um, uh, but as you know, the caveat um, um, has to be, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, the you know, proceedings are still ongoing. Uh, there's an investigation with the IOPC, uh, uh, and they've escalated that recently, actually, to gross misconduct. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, that's just procedurally. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, today, we've, we've talked about no laws were broken. Um, but I think quite evidently, quite clearly, um, procedures uh, where, in my opinion, uh, my perspective, procedures were, were completely, um, uh, uh, you know, wrong. Um, I'll give the legislative context. Uh, you're all familiar with working together. So um, uh, uh, working together 2018, um, and this is what governs and really describes and lays out how we should be working together. The police uh, are part of that, um, and the police have that designated statutory duty alongside um, the local authorities, as well as um, uh, uh, health and, and uh, our health colleagues in. CCGs. So it makes it very, very clear um, all the way to the top um, from the chief constable all the way down to whether he or she delegates those uh, duties to. So from frontline police and officer all the way to chief, um, you know, uh, police have very clear duties around safeguarding. And what those duties are, um, the College of Policing. So you, you might you might be familiar with the College of Policing. Um, just, I just think about social work England or think about um, uh, nice, you know, just to kind of give you that uh, uh, comparison. Uh, College of Policing really sets out what, and well, really sets out what and how police officers should be practicing from a, from a professional perspective. You might hear the term APP. If you haven't, um, their website is really interactive, pretty easy to digest. The APP is what police officers bound by. Um, and you will see there, uh, all police officers must establish the welfare um, um, of the children, of the child. So, uh, you know, seeing and speaking to children from an inspection perspective, you know, I we look for this all the time, uh, uh, try to understand, uh, uh, you know, what the children are feeling at the time, um, trying to get their, uh, their perspective, their understanding, the police are due to bound uh, to understand and gather that. Um, but that last bullet point for me uh, really hits the nail for me, and that is around communication. So, you know, thinking of the context of um, the young child, um, even if police officers are, you know, constantly, police officers will be looking and, as you as you're all aware, um, usually on edge, right? So, um, but even if, nevertheless, even if you're communicating with children, um, the possibility of any type of future prosecution when you're dealing with children, um, it shouldn't uh, prevent you from 
just basic communication with the child um, because you're always trying to promote and safeguard um, that child. So we all know, we all agree unanimously um, that the young girl, the child Q was criminalized. Uh, and we all know, um, you know, that young black children continue to be criminalized um, uh, just based on biases uh, and um, racism. Um, but when we, when the police, because I think that if I can speak freely, I think, you know, one, one huge problem with, with, with this whole incident uh, is that the Met Police were very, very defensive. Uh, uh, and um, it shouldn't, you know, what, sh what, what, you sh what shouldn't be happening is entering a mode of defensiveness, especially when clearly, um, uh, you know, the practice, you know, that happened in the school clearly, clearly um, broke any type of guidelines. Um, yeah, so for me, communication uh, is, is, you know, police officers are duty bound in, in the College of Police and APP uh, there, so uh, there shouldn't be any excuses uh, at all. Um, so yeah, policing uh, duties and powers, um, police officers uh, have uh, a plethora of, of powers. Uh, and one of the most basic ways I try to explain police powers is uh, the police officers, especially in this country, uh, police officers um, have um, uh, so many powers, um, but however, they can't just use those powers uh, and, and grounds must be established before you use those powers. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's good for us to be just to be aware of some of them. Um, Section 17 of PACE, for example, you would often hear uh, police officers throw out lots of different police powers. And I've listed some of them here uh, at the bottom. 23 Misuse of Drugs Act, Section 1 of PACE. Those are, used, those are the two most common police powers, stuff and search powers used by police officers. Um, and I'll save the detail for the Q&A bit, but um, oftentimes there are other powers that police officers may try and use or, well, or are available to police to use. Uh, to stop and search uh, uh, black people or, or, or uh, people in general, but often, oftentimes they will use um, uh, 23 misuse of drugs, and that just that just comes from a place of, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, stereotypes, racism, uh, and biases when you're having media, uh, TV shows, television, um, uh, you know, uh, everything kind of just influencing what you think and how you feel. Um, and not checking for your own biases, taking that, going into the streets uh, and stopping the searching and harassing people. That's where those uh, influences come from. You often hear glazed eyes, smell of cannabis. The APP is also clear that uh, in itself is not enough for the police to uh, um, use grounds to stop the search. Um, HMI CFRS, uh, uh, who I work for, um, February last year highlighted, uh, produced, a report, we produced a report last year, which highlighted uh, a concern about the disproportionate use of stuff in search. Uh, and it's a pretty good report. I'll, I'll put that in, in the chat um, later on. Um, and there are lots of other powers too, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that um, much later on. The, the top line data there, because um, uh, there was some data mentioned earlier, um, uh, some of you will already know this, but uh, in London, 75%, um, just over 75% actually, of, of children who were strip searched um, in the last three years from diverse backgrounds. Uh, and, um, and even within that, that doesn't cover those who um, were actually uh, searched after arrest. Um, so which means there's a whole lot of people who were searched, nothing, and then um, uh, not arrested. Um, just a couple of uh, reflections again. Um, uh, I think the biggest issue for me um, is using um, stop the search as a tool, um, uh, just a binary focus on, on criminal justice, um, instead of using stop the search uh, as a tool to safeguard, because it can be used as a tool to, uh, to safeguard children. Just in the same way, um, when children go missing, um, you know, there are ways that police can use some of their powers to safeguard missing children. Um, uh, but oftentimes it isn't. Uh, and we see that in how things play out with children who are exploited, uh, children who uh, are 
you know, involving to county lines, et cetera, et cetera, and how that is policed and how that is, is, is kind of be criminalized. Um, seeing children as children, that was a big problem, um, uh, and, and it still is. Um, uh, and, and just to, as professionals, you know, I do think that um, uh, we need, we, we can and should um, be asking more questions. There was too much of a deference of, by the school uh, to police. Um, and oftentimes we see that too, um, not just by school, but we often see just in meetings or in, uh, in um, child protection meetings, uh, in strap meetings, there often is a deference to police. Um, but we need to be able to, uh, and we should be asking way more questions, um, uh, uh, especially uh, directed to, uh, to police. Um, here, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, uh, safeguarding reviews uh, as well as um, what's on offer and some of the things that we can tap into. Because um, uh, I do think that, you know, we need to be able to, uh, and Rosemary had a really, really good point about being at the table, but we also need to be um, uh, more organized uh, and, and utilize um, uh, what we do have. Uh, uh, anytime that there's any issue, we should be asking uh, a lot more questions whenever there's anything, especially around local reviews. We know how fragmented and disjointed the system is, but individually, I think that um, when we do come together, that there's, there's, there's collective power in that voice, especially when we're, when, when we're questioning um, some of our leaders uh, or, those, or those who are in leadership positions around what's available uh, and what should be done. Um, uh, some of you on the call will be uh, strategic leaders, um, uh, you know, just trying to understand whether, you know, pe people who you manage, you oversee, you lead, uh, do they understand the child safeguarding system? Um, uh, do your children, do children and families uh, and young people in your area understand the safeguarding system? Um, do you know what role you play? Um, and some of these questions um, I often ask, will ask to police. Um, uh, when I'm inspecting the police, uh, uh, because the police are a principal part of, of uh, that safeguarding system. And if that isn't, if there isn't enough uh, evidence that, you know, that the police are also engaged in that multi-agency setup, um, then that's often, it's always reflected in, in, in how, we, um, uh, how we report that from an inspection uh, perspective. But at the bottom there, the role and sometimes impact of inspections um uh that's just again trying to understand um why um uh, uh inspections um uh and the inspection program um is is developed in the next in the next year um you will see if you haven't already um you would have noticed that hyp uh, produced uh, uh, an inspection report into the experiences of black black uh black children in the youth justice system and the HMICFRS uh, will be looking into something similar um, uh, next year around uh, around race. Um, just some other things that, that are uh, that are out now in the system. Recently, uh, publication of the National Learning Review of Arthur Star, uh, as well as um, keep keep just be be alive to the fact that uh, J ties. You all be familiar with J ties. There's going to be more J ties now this year, uh, which will be looking at. Uh, 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 the experience of children at the front door, as well as uh, exploitation. But I just wanted to end, though, uh, very quickly on uh, the reason why we're, we're here today um, and just understanding um, uh, Child Q's voice. Um, and you, you see that on there, you know, from a professional perspective, um, it, you know, it was an unacceptable to us. And if she could see that things needed to change, if she could see that it was completely wrong, um, and uh, I think this should really, really, this is a quote that I have um, uh, as my background, uh, as something that we just need to make sure it, it doesn't happen uh, uh, ever again, at least uh, committed to that. Anyway. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'll be around for uh, the panel. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, thank you so much, Ade, and thank you to all of our speakers who have shared with such insight and passion, their experiences, their thoughts. Um, and it, it's, it's, 
it's stunned me to silence um, because of the realities of what we deal with as professionals on a day-to-day -day basis. And having this space to reflect on what's actually happened, how it's happened, and what we what we now need to do. Because it's not a case of, right, we've had this conversation, great, I'll go back and continue to practice in a way I do. No, something needs to be done. We need to do something differently. We're going to be moving on to the next part. Um, so what we, what we decided to do, because there were over a thousand registrants for the conference, and we thought it'd be really difficult to open it up to have you ask questions. So we're glad that you've been using the chat and we're glad that people are responding within the chat. But what we purposely asked you to do was to, 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 to let us know what one thing you wanted to get from the conference. And what Arlene and I did from that was to come up with six key questions from those responses that you gave us when you registered. So we hope that, oh, have I gone? I've gone. Have I gone? No, you no, no. Oh, hear we can, you. We can hear you. We can <laughs> just disappeared. No can. apologies. So yeah. what we want to do now is to have a panel discussion. And I'm hoping that Arlene and I have, have really honed in and targeted those key things that you've all said that you wanted to get from this conference and turn them into questions I hope you feel will answer some of those niggling things, some of those thoughts that you have going on in your mind, some of the things that you're reflecting on even now, as you've probably heard new things, new information, new statistics, and the different experiences of those people on the panel. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to start with my first question. Now, I'm, I'm going to go a bit out of order. So initially, I had them all in the order that I wanted to ask. But one of the things that sort of struck me as the host, I want to understand, and I'm sure from what people have asked um, when they registered, why is there such a misuse of power when it comes to dealing with Black, African, and Caribbean children? If I could take a response from Ade to start with, please. Oh, Ade's gone, so maybe I need to take. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm here. I, okay. I, I turned my phone yeah. off. Because of the, the okay. bandwidth, but I didn't hear your question. Sorry. So why do you think that why do you think that there's such a misuse of power? What I what I term is a misuse of power when it comes to dealing with um, black, African, and Caribbean children in these different systems. Um I I just think that uh, it's it's a, it's a couple of things. It's it's a lack of respect, it's a it's fear, um, it is uh uh, uh, prejudices, discrimination, racism, all of those things uh, influence, uh, and then obviously, and also just bigotry. Um, uh, I, when I, when I go out policing, so I intentionally, um, one of the reasons why I joined as a special constable as a police officer is to, it, it is essentially to, to engage with um, uh, and speak to uh, black people uh, in 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 London. Um, and I've never had a, a problematic engagement with, um, with Black people or anyone whilst policing. Um, I have seen problematic encounters uh, uh, while policing. Um, and, and, and I just think that sometimes, um, and it's not all, obviously not all police officers, but sometimes um, some police officers uh, don't know how to um, uh, disengage from you know this warped reality that they, that they have uh, created usually online uh, influenced by uh, the media uh, and because they're just so heightened um, uh, uh, it, it goes into they go straight into disrespect mode which is just to kind of give you um, on a practical sense response police officers um, when they start their shift, Response police officers, you know, have a briefing uh, at the start of the shift. It's the very first thing you do: the start the shift, and then you start your shift, and then you see some slides on, you know, various uh, uh, issues of the day, right? Um, whatever the problems are, whether it's antisocial behavior on an estate or uh, one of the residents complaining about, um, I don't know, graffiti, two drug dealing, two um, missing people, two wanted people. Right. And if you're seen 
uh, uh, different pictures, you know, and I don't want to go too deep, obviously, because uh, on a side note, we have seen publication from some police forces uh, on uh, who is wanted, um, and they usually tend to publish black faces. But the, but the white faces, they won't publish, but that's a side note. But if you're, if you're in that briefing and you're receiving that, that level of information and it's about uh, the warning markers, the, the known for violence, known for drugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and then you go out on the street into your car or on foot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you see um, a black person driving or a black person walking, um, you, you know, the, the, those prejudices um, uh, often tend to uh, take over, I feel. I feel, and I don't know, um, you know, I, I, it baffles me um, when that level of engagement begins and it escalates as opposed to de-escalate. Um, so I, I think I think that it's it's uh, it's it's policing in, in on the streets uh, uh, tends can be problematic. Uh, it, it still is, um, uh, but um, you know, uh, you know, I can't really speak categorically um, for for those officers um, who uh, you know don't um, uh, uh, don't know how to conduct themselves in a more professional manner other than what I can think of is just um, a abject level of, of disrespect of uh, black people and black kids especially black teenage boys or, or just teenagers just teenagers as well Thank you, Ade. Thank you for that response. Um, Arlene, can I, can I get a response from you, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, my starting point would be um, going back to slavery and thinking about how do we control and a sense of that um, Rosemary talks about us being a global majority. And during the times of slavery, we were it was a lot more black people and very few white people. And what do you do is you get into a mindset of how do you try and control? And I think underlining this all is this sense of that we're some, we're people that need to be controlled. And in order to do that, we need to misuse our power in order to con try to control people. And um, Ade has responded, but I think I would wanna add that let's stop just blaming the police because there's, you know, schools do it, um, social workers do it. We misuse our power and Chantel talked about issues about um, making decisions as social workers about a black man and what does that mean in terms of him um, controlling, I'm sorry, parenting his child. We as social workers misuse our power in terms of some of the decisions we make. Schools misuse their power in terms of controlling children in an environment. So I think really um, we need to go beyond blaming the, just the police. Obviously when we're talking about child Q, they, they had a clear role in it, but I think actually we all as professionals need to know our, our sense of power and if we are not aware of um, our power enough that we begin to misuse our power and just briefly I'm going to say one of the things that um, one of the people on um, this chat is somebody that I went to school with and one of the things we we left school with is the people who became at a please close your ears in case this doesn't pertain to you but we feel this particularly with white police officers the ones who were bullied in school are the ones who become police officers and they misuse that power. And, and I've seen it in, as social workers, sometimes people and managers who um, don't know how to do their social work, don't know how to manage their team and abuse their power. So I think all of us in all of our um, respective professions need to think about how we do our thing in our work environment and look at ourselves first and foremost. So that's one of the things that I want to add to that discussion about misuse of power. Thank, thank you, Arlene. And that leads me really nicely into a question that I'd like to pose to a number of the panels. So in thinking about these questions and thinking about what you responded, a lot of people said that they wanted to understand you know, the development of black, pe black young people um, and think about, you know, how they transition through adulthood. So I'd like to put to Rosemary, if I may come to you first, please, Rosemary. 
Why do we need to understand um, black children's experiences to keep them safe? Why is that an important aspect of safeguarding? And also as a sub question, do black children develop differently to white children? Thank you, Rosemary. Denise, forgive me. I'm going to do what I often do. I want to go back to the power question before I answer the question that you've just asked. To add to Arlene and Ade's very good answers. The question about misuse of power in Britain goes back to Britain's misuse of power when it went out and colonized so much of what became the British Empire. And part of the reason why there is a specific focus now on African and African Caribbean people is that when we were colonized, we were dehumanized. And so that dehumanization that works out in our policies today comes back from the colonial period of misuse of power. They colonize more than black people, but they dehumanize Africans over centuries. So that's the power question. So going back to do black and white children um, develop differently, um, no. You know, children are human beings and they develop as they develop. What is key to understanding what happens within systemically racist societies that will not accept that they are systemically racist is that black becomes a, um, a way of defining our children that as we have said, dehumanizes them, places them in a hierarchy, um, a eugenicist hierarchy that has them at the bottom underneath other races in terms of IQ intelligence, likens us to animals and therefore baked within the system, whether we're looking at the way we assessed through standardized assessment tests in SATs, whether we are looking at how we assess for IQ, whether we're looking at how we assess the special needs, whether we look at all the psychological, psychometric assessments that are used, baked into all of those assessments will be an assessment that places black children at the bottom. And so good teachers, good white teachers, good white police officers, good white social, uh, social workers, are working with tools that have already got the racist ways of and lens in the way that they practice, which is why we can talk about people not breaking laws because the racism is baked into laws, not breaking policies because the racism is baked into policies. So it's not really the children that we need to be looking at in terms of do black children develop different from white children? It's how the system interacts with black children. That's where the focus needs to be. And so if there's any change in terms of how we begin to understand black children, understand how colorism, caste, um, religion, Etc., 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 language, all of those things that would normally be part of a child's socialization. As you, listen, in London now, when we look at the percentage of um, Black and global majority um, young people in London schools, colleges, and universities, that is around about 73% of the demographic in London, black and global majority. A lot of those will be African children. Tell me how many African languages you can study at GCSE. 
So our system has already stripped away um, anything that would be part of a normal child's psychological development. Their language, their culture, their ways of being, it's replaced it with colorism, with black being um, associated with underachievement, with black being associated with us um, being badly behaved, disproportionately represented in exclusions, and that's the psyche of what it is to be black in Britain. So it's not the child we need to look at. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your response, Rosemary. So in following that up, you know, um, within practice sometimes, within social work practice, in order to work, in order to work with Black, African and Caribbean children, we need to have an understanding of their starting point. As you said, you know, when, when, when you said earlier about you know, you brought yourself to the table and you defined and identified who you are. That child needs to be able to come to the table and identify who they are. And it's only by that child having that identity that professionals can now start to work with and unpick some of the issues that may be going on for that child. So again, I'm, try I'm trying not to be cynical because you've raised so many issues to me today that's left me thinking, well, we're really traumatized. How are we going to get out of this? We are in a system that is not set up to support us. How are we going to get out of this? So I want to pose a question, if I may, to Diane. Is Diane still, Diane still there? Sorry, I can't see all of the speakers on my screen. Yeah, yeah she, is, she is. She yeah. is. We want. We clearly, from this discussion, we want to have something that's meaningful and be able to bring about a change. What can we do to bring about a purposeful and meaningful? legislative or policy change that will will challenge the structures that will make a difference what can we do um it's not necessarily a legislative change i mean bob marley had the words we need to free ourselves from mental slavery but i want to just go back to the question about power the first question you put to the panel why is there a misuse of power it's because the people with power in these institutions whether it's schools or policing or social work are white it's quite simple um and as rosemary has touched on there is a history going back to slavery and beyond of the way that white people see and the way that they treat people. Now, how do you do something about it? About this? Partly, it's about having more black people in these institutions at every level. But I would just make a point that having a black people in an institution, or even having a black person very senior in an institution, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to challenge institutional racism. And I'll just take one second to say, let's look at the issue of women and sexism. The Metropolitan Police Force has a very poor history in relation to the treatment of women, the sexism, and all the rest of it. And, you know, up until this year, the Metropolitan Police Force had a female commissioner, Cressida Dick, but that didn't change anything because because in order to get that high up the ranks, in order to become the first female Metropolitan Police Commissioner, she had to internalize so many norms. And she had self-centered herself for so long, she couldn't think outside the norms of the Metropolitan Police. And the same is true of black people within institutions. So you have to have more black people in institutions, but they have to, and you need, as I say, a critical mass. They have to be empowered to challenge what goes on in these institutions. But we also have to support parents, if you talk about education and the community more generally, to, to engage, to challenge, to question. And it's important to support parents of the community because if you take Hackney, I mean, Hackney is where I live and it's the community I've, I've represented for over 30 years. What you've seen in Hackney, and it may not be true in other parts of the country, what you've seen in Hackney it's tremendous gentrification. So on the one hand, you have the poor, both black and white, still basically trapped on their estates. They're not going anywhere. You know, to buy a house in Hackney now, and again, this may not be relevant to people on this call from outside of London, but to buy a house in Hackney now, a, a, a 
family house, three bedrooms. You're talking about a million pounds, a cool million pounds, right? So the poor working people, black, white, are trapped on their estates. Yet we're having increasing numbers of middle-class white people who can afford a house for a million pounds. And so what happens, talking about power, what happens within those institutions, education, policing, whatever, they listen to the people with the loudest voices. And the people with the loudest voices in Hackney, I can only speak for Hackney, are your white middle-class gentrifiers. That's why it's so important to empower black professionals inside institutions and to empower, empower parents and the community, because that's how you improve the balance of power. So there's no legislation. I mean, there's things you can do on the margin about legislation, but in the end, we have to free ourselves from mental slavery and we have to make our numbers count and we have to understand our history in the way that Rosemary has touched on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Diane. Uh, it sort of brings together nicely the the overall, um, you know, theme that's coming through about the, the, the community and the village and bringing people together. So thank you for that um, considered response. So um, Chantal, from a social worker's, from a social work perspective, what needs to change? What, what do we as social workers need to do differently? I think we've heard, you know, heard from the other panelists and the other speakers around, you know, um, the power, um, privilege and, you know, what we need to do as a, as a collective. Um, I think from a social work perspective, it, it, it does, you know, we have to look at what our social workers are telling us. We have to look at what our children in care are telling us. We have to look at what the um, um, the professionals within the profession, what, what, what are they saying? You know, what we know is, you know, black children are, you know, um, um, how, I don't can't remember the number, but much more likely to become subject to child protection plans. What we know is the higher you climb in social work, you know, um, the whiter it gets. So we talk about the snowy white peaks. What is going on, what is going on there? What we know is that black students are more likely to fail their, their, their practice placements, are more likely to fail their ASYE, you know, their first year as, as qualified social workers, um, and are more likely to, to face racial traumas and all the, you know, all the, all the, all the things that we've been, we've been kind of been discussing today. So what needs to change? Lots of things, lots of things need to change. Um, I think the first thing that needs to change is to have um, anti-racist practice on our pre-qualifying standards. So it's something that social workers talk about from the beginning of their training, and it's not something that sprung up on them as they you know, go to their first home and meet a, a black person for the first time you know, as a service user, and they're not sure how to have that conversation about where you're from. We've spoken about um, children knowing their identity and being able to talk about their identity so we can better safeguard, better assess, better you know, um, and plan for these children. But how are we going to do that if social workers are scared to, to ask people, you know, um, about their uh, uh, cultural background or about how, you know, they function in, in their family? So we need to start from, from basics. We need to have, you know, particular conversations have um, been implemented from, from student stages, as well as, you know, um, as part of the PCFs, as we, as, we, as we qualify and as we climb the ladder in social work as well. Something that has to be evidence and something that has to be articulated as we continue um, mm -hmm. um, through the profession. As I mentioned, it's becoming, it's a journey. Um, mm. And again, it's about looking, you know, looking at the white institution. What, what, what does that say? How does that speak to um, um, our, our, our service users or, you know, people with living experience, as well as the staff within the organisation as well? But there is a lot of work around, you know, working with, with families. But what about the staff in the institution that are going through racism and that, you know, are finding it difficult to climb? Sally, who started with me, you know, is able to climb that ladder a lot quicker. What is that about? Our, our, our systems and our structures are inherently racist and it's that that needs to be challenged and it's that that needs to be acknowledged and I think that's where you know we can we can start um as well thank, thank, thank you, you for that response Chantel so I want to put this question out to everybody on the panel so we obviously um you know during sort of we had we had the George Floyd issue didn't we and we saw organizations committing to changing and training being rolled out and everybody's getting on board and you know we, we, we've got allies and things like that so there, there was this great shift of great movement towards working together but I don't see that anything's changed so I want to ask each of you if you could just give me just a brief very brief because I think I'm going over time what training do you think individuals and organizations need to safeguard effectively safeguard 
Black, African and Caribbean children. Can I start with Jacqueline and then I'll... You're on mute. I think from the real grassroots level, um, training for, for people to be able um, to ask the difficult questions and, and challenge things that are difficult and, and kind of rock the boat. Um, I think sometimes Diana will know about this, um, you know, sometimes you've got to be the, the pioneer almost um, to get things moving. Um, or as a, as a black person, because you're the black person, everything's kind of come on you. It's like almost your responsibility. And I think mm. there needs to be training that, you know, just like we say, um, um, safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. It is, but in all aspects of safeguarding, including around racism, um, et cetera. Um, and not, and, and it's, it's something that needs to be embedded all the time, not just when there's a little, you know, something awful happens and there's a knee jerk reaction and we're all cross for a little while and then we move on. It's got to be something that's continuously thought about and that from, uh, from everyone though, not that just mm. that the people of colour have got to take that full responsibility. Although I do agree, we need to do that, be the, take the lead and we don't need anyone to be our savior anymore. You know, from a human perspective, we need to, to kind of save ourselves, if you like, we need to be there to, to protect our children ourselves. But I think, it, it, you know, at the, the very lowest of training, it needs to be embedded all the time and not, not just, like I've said, when there's a something happens and there's a, a big knee jerk reaction. And I think we need to be prepared for the, the aftermath of it because there, the, you are going to be get accused of all and sundry. You've got a chip on your shoulder, you're always bringing up race, everything's about race, you're da 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 da. But like you rightly said earlier, but it is, that's the reality. So that's mm. where we have to challenge it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's really useful. And, and can I go to Chantelle? I'm just going as you appear on the screen. So <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, yeah, and thanks for that, Jacqueline. I think what I'll add to that, because of course it starts with, you know, practitioners have a part to play, but I think the leadership, you know, what my research is looking at for my PhD is around anti-racist leadership, because I do feel, you know, we do put a lot of onus on the students and practitioners to change systems and structures or to try to do that yes there's a part for them to play and we spoke about everybody having their own agency but we have to look at the leaders come on man they've got the power they've got the privilege they've got the money they've got the you know um they've got the the you know they're much in a better position yes i know it's a system that benefits them so why are they going to be likely you know or you know to to, to make the changes but how however you know if they want you know to to make more money to make their systems fairer and safer and you know there's a benefit for them as well it's just about helping them recognize that as well as us you know if we're not invited to the table bringing our own table you know beating down the doors to get in to be in those positions i see people talking about um being involved in governors and in their schools and you know those kind of decision we have to be in the decision making seats you know we have to be in those you know at those tables having those conversations with those people that 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 can make you know um and be in the position that make make the changes yes not all skin folk are kin folk you know but it's having the right people at the table tables at the right time having those conversations and I think that's where we need to do to do um, look at the bottom up yes but top down I think it has much more significant and a much more um, greater impact if we're going to ever move forward thank Becky, you I, love, I mean sorry Chantal I love your little things right but you know that's a black saying so you need to break that down about skin folk being kin folk <laughs> you need to explain that so not everybody's going to understand that one I, I, well, you know, it, it just goes on the back of what Diane was saying, you know, in relation to, you know, yes, you know, we talk about having people that represent us in, 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 you know, in certain positions, but just because someone has a black skin, just because somebody is brown, you know, just because somebody is non-white, it doesn't necessarily mean they can challenge, they can champion, they want to champion, they want to challenge, you know, for them, it's easier just to put their head under the table, they, they feel, you know, great that they're in that position, and then they forget, you know, that they once lived on a council estate, or they, or maybe they did it you know I'm talking about myself you know I can never forget where I'm coming from another saying never you throw stones behind you you know what I mean don't ever do that you don't forget where you're coming from you know um so I think it's important that we remember have that that mindset I remember what it was like you know to live on you know a certain amount of money a week you know I know what it's like to, to you know for people to look down at you and think that you're going to be nothing um so I think when you get yourself into those positions um it's important you remember that you know and it's important that you 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 take on that mindset and you know you you, you make the decisions you champion you make those votes you know in order to help you know you know the, the people that, that are coming and you pull up people behind you as well you know don't slam doors you know you push those doors
doors wide open and get let the, the next um, set of people come in as well. And that's why I like the position that I'm in in terms of working with the students and working with the ne next generation of social workers because I can be that lecturer, I can be that mentor, I can be that person that I never had when I was coming up as a, as a social worker as well. Is that all right for you, Thank Arlene? You. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Um, no Rose, Rosemary, please, can I get a response from you um, to the same question? Yeah, very, very, very quickly. Um, I think one of the things that we need to do as Black professionals uh, is to shine a light on the difference that we are all making within our sectors. There's brilliant work going on in education. Um, by um, black professionals. There'll be brilliant work um, going on amongst black social workers as well, and, and probably even in the police, who knows, right? Um, what we actually need to do is to begin to shine a light on the excellent work and the difference that we are making that will change the narrative and make us feel a lot less powerless. As bad as things are, there would be a lot worse if there wasn't um, conscious work going on. We're the most active community in the UK. We are the most active community in the UK, changing things for the better for all other communities, including ourselves. If we weren't there, things would be a lot worse in education, in social work, in policing, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that we need to do as black people outside of official training is to, for us to begin to invest in personal development and our organizations invest in personal development, which is around decolonizing our minds and healing from racial trauma of living under the white gaze. Otherwise, we will none, none of the training, none of the work that we're doing within our work will be will will will, will make any difference because we are traumatized. So that's something that we as a people need to be investing in and doing work in. Um, out, outside of the professional training um, that we're doing in terms of good anti-racism and decolonial work. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, and Ade, please, could I get a response from you? Yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned George Floyd, uh, and uh, uh, that was what really sparked the birth of Kijiji and, and why we met, myself and Laurel met. And coming from two different sectors, you know, we just wanted to bring um, uh, black safeguarding professionals together. That was that continues to be the main driver. I think we just need to invest in ourselves. To answer your question directly, uh, Winnie, yeah, that, that that's what uh, drives us right now. Invest in black safeguarding professionals, who ultimately uh, invest in in black children. Uh, obviously, all children, but but we know that uh, we know that we are investing in in, in our black children, uh, and and and. And one of the first questions we wanted to answer was, was you know, what are the needs of black safeguard professionals? What is it? Is it career progression? Is it more training? Um, uh, is it more uh, uh, racial trauma awareness? What is it? And that's, and that's one of the things that, well, it's one of the very first things we did uh, when we started. So um, uh, yeah, in, it just do that investment. What needs to change? You have to spend more time investing in, in each other. Uh, and um, as you said, Kijiji is, uh, is it, it takes a village. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Have I missed anybody? I can't see everybody on the, the list. Yeah, Arlene, sorry. Me. What about me? I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. I'm so Arlene. sorry. I'm trying. I'm just so engrossed in the responses. Apologies, Arlene. How long have we been working on this and you're forgetting me? Anyway. Okay. So I think for me, what I'd want to start off by saying is remembering what we've all talked about. And um, Ada, you mentioned it about a village raising a child. Okay, so for me, if we start there, then we have to be the um, ones as, um, again, a term that Rosemary uses fondly, and I want to be able to jump on the bag wagon, that I'm a young elder, and I have a responsibility to support people who have got children younger than mine, mine are all adults, to support them and talk to them. And I think if we all do that, then we start with our training in our home and that's what we are used to. I think what we've done so much as black people and we've allowed people to tell us what our agenda is and we need to claim it back. And one of the big things for me is this whole topic and I, Diane, you mentioned it, diversity. I have never liked that term, diversity. I don't know what it means. It doesn't pertain to me. And I want to go back to when we used to talk about anti-racist practice and anti-discriminatory practice, because then I know 
what we're talking about. And that means that we're talking about race issues. I don't want, I, I, I started off my talk talking about all the identities I have. And those are all important to me, but the one that affects me most is being black. And the ones that affect most children are about being black. And so I think the training that we need is to be in the classroom um, and I mean, whether it's in a virtual world or in a physical world, I don't want, and I'm being really powerful here, I don't want white people to tell me about what being anti-racist is, because they can't tell me that, okay? It needs to come from black people, because we know how to walk in that space. I don't mind having a white ally working together, because I'm not saying that we can do it on our own. But if we're, if I'm looking at um, issues around black children's experience in terms of safeguarding it needs to be a black person talking to um, another black person as a social worker but also black and um, white um, social workers to keep us safe we also need to understand it's an earlier question that you asked was um, we are not different in terms of our developmental need, but we have different experiences because of all the things that we talked about in this space. And so we need people who understand that. And I've even found as a black academic, I'm trying to write something and I have to write it in a white pay way in order for that to be heard. I can't write it in a white way because I'm not white. Although I was born in this country, my experience can only come from my own value base. So I need to be able to write it in a way and white people out there need to be able to hear me and without me having to change the way I am saying what I'm saying in order for it to, to be heard. And I saw somebody talk about in, in the chat about being a, a CP chair, all those, pay, uh, sorry, child protection chair, all those positions are powerful positions in social work. Why does a, a, a black professional feel that they don't have the power? And we need to, to look at that, as Chantel said, in terms of the organizations um, that we work with in, that they need to be able to hear us as professionals and not try to make us be white in the way that we present our narrative in order for them to hear that. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, um, oh, hello. Oh, sorry, Di I just I told hello. you. I'm sorry, Diane, I, I told you I can't see you. Please, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, please, I no, apologize. Right. I thought um, you got the thing, I thought you'd gone, sorry. Carry, sorry, no. do carry on. Um, just to say, I mean, I agree with everything that people have said. I, I would just say one thing about um, change and, safeguarding children, protecting our children and so on. Um, my mother used to say that people that can't hear must feel. And what she meant was that you can talky talky talk, but in the end, people have to feel some kind of sanction before they change their behavior. And terrible things happening to their children and child cues happening to our children. And child cue is an example of that. But however terrible the things that happen to our children are, no one gets sanctioned, no one gets disciplined, no one gets reprimanded, no one even loses their job. And with Child Q, you've got teachers who failed her, you've got police officers that failed to um, have proper process. And I think one of the things we should be doing, on top of all the things people are talking about, are insisting, is it, I was saying that when terrible things happen to our children, that people, are disciplined and that white people and black people, if, if that's them, people in power don't think they can damage and brutalize and marginalize our children without paying a price in terms of their job and their career. And it comes back to what I said earlier about us coming together as a community, about supporting each other. Because all too often you get black people in institutions who don't support other black people. So it's, it's about coming together as a collective. It's about supporting each other, empowering each other, and making sure that when terrible things happen to our children, people are reprimanded, people are disciplined, and people understand that you can't you can't mess with our children and ruin their lives and nothing is going to happen to you. Something needs to happen to them and we need to insist on it. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. So, um, sorry, I've just been, it's just been pointed out to me that one of the questions, I might have skipped over it a bit quickly, 
um, and, and people still feel that they want to know, how do we keep black children safe in education? Please, I'm opening it up. Please respond. How do we keep our children safe in education? Okay, I'm willing to start, although I'm not an educationist, but I'm a mum. So my starting point was being able to help my children to navigate this system. So interestingly, when Child Q happened, I was talking to my daughter, who's on the call, was um, that mum, I knew that you would say something you would do something. So I would have said no and dealt with the consequences. And that's paraphrasing her. Um, and I also have my son who's on this call, who when, he's a trainee um, solicitor, and I cannot tell you how many times he still gets stopped. But what he knows to do is because of what I've taught him from a very young age is to talk them into them in the language that they need to hear. Okay. And that's being clear about what your rights are without kicking off. And I think it's our responsibility as black parents to support our children so they know how to navigate this system, which also includes being that parent that's up in the school. Um, my sister is also on the call. I cannot tell you that she has been, and she was a teacher, um, that she'd come to me, come with me when they have stopped my son and um, accused him of doing things that he wasn't doing. We need to have that community around us being prepared to go into the places that we need to. I was a governor of their school. I did everything so that I was in their face constantly um, and also making sure that I supported my children with extra things because the school system, I think um, Rosemary said this, the school system is not set up to educate our children. Yeah. And so we need to do what we can do to educate our children outside of school. They have to go to school, but we also need to support them with all the information that they have to navigate this system because it isn't going to change quickly. Thank you, Arlene. Can I can I get one more response, please? I think Rosemary, you've got. Yeah, I wanted to add to what Arlene said. So um, as well as what we're doing in the home, what Arlene is doing and other um, black parents are doing, the other thing that we need to do is to understand that we are sharing the education of our children with our with with schools. It is our responsibility to educate our children. Yes. So actually, we're sharing that responsibility with schools. So that might come as a realization. What that then means is that we need to be intentional about the point at which we are sharing our children with our schools. We don't put them in any and any nursery school. We don't put them in any and any primary school. We move into those areas if we want them to be, from the time you have a child, think about where you want them to be at secondary and move into those areas. In London and Birmingham, definitely, we can navigate a system to ensure that our children will be in schools where there are either black leaders or sufficient numbers of conscious black teachers to ensure that our children get safe passage through. But that doesn't happen in July when you're, or, or May, when you're selecting your secondary school for your child and you, and, and you haven't thought about that from when they were zero months or old in your belly. So what we need to do is to navigate the system by finding those schools where there are black professionals, make it our business, where there are good white uh, allies who are running anti-racist schools, and we ensure that our children are in those spaces. And we can do that in London and Birmingham. I can do that, I've done that for my nieces in Birmingham. They go to that nursery school, that primary school, there's a number of them, and that secondary school. And when they go to that college, I know that there's pastoral people there who will be putting the, place, the, the things in place to support them through university. That's how intentional and organized we need to be. And we need to get on with it now. Thank you, Rosemary. Oh my days. I mean, I wish I could go on, but I'm, I'm being wrapped on my knuckles because I can't believe that it's 4.20. We've not even had an opportunity to go to our breakout sessions. So I just want to sort of summarize and sort of draw the panel session. I wish we had more time 
you know, together and then give people an opportunity to pop off and use the link to join the, the, the feedback session. But there are some key things that have been raised and discussed here. We've provided this forum as a safe space for people to talk about this issue. For to be able to talk about being black, what it means to be black in education, in the social care system, in, in health. And this is just a starting point. I really do not want us to lose this momentum. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is that we're not just speaking about it, we're being about it. And we've started to talk about the community mentality, the Kijiji, the village, the things like that. We have got a responsibility to take this forward. This is how we start the process of healing from the trauma by picking up the mantle and doing what it is that we need to do for our children. And even if you do not have children yourself, there may be children within your families. You may work with children and young people. Somebody said it earlier on, would you have treated child Q in the same way had it been your own child? So we need to start thinking about our young people and our children in this way. They are ours. They are ours. They are yours. They are ours. We are a community. So I really just want to thank every single person that has been here, everybody. My, our panelists, I thank you. I applaud you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this. Thank you for sharing so candidly and speaking so openly, no holes barred. I'd love that about this. No holes barred. I'm just telling it as it is. And I appreciate that candidness. I'm hoping that everybody that's been part of this, who's on the chat, who's fed back, thank you. Thank you for your input. Thank you for questioning yourself. Thank you for asking them the challenging questions and thinking about it. I hope you go away and you're able to reflect on some of these things. And from today, do something different. Do something different in your practice. Do something different at home. Rosemary said, go and find out about that school. Go and find out about what's happening. Ask somebody questions if you don't know it. Speak to the police. Think about what we need to do in terms of training. We've got to do more. This is not, this is just not enough. We have got to do more. I'm going to get off my soapbox now because I'm going to be told off in a minute. Thank you to Diane Abbott. Thank you to Jacqueline Say, Chantel Thomas, Rosemary Campbell Stevens, Ade Salarin, Arlene. Thank you for coming to me with this vision. You knew I would be on board with this vision, and I thank you for making me a part of this. I want to thank Neil, who has been amazing. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope that you're able to join the next session which is where we'll start to unpick and maybe look at some more of those questions um, that people have been asking in the chat. So it's just an opportunity for our panelists to say goodbye to everybody now. Goodbye, everybody. Looking forward to the strategy session that will come from this. That's a simple thing. That's what we need to do these days. Run these conferences, have the panelists, set up a working group, and then we do the strategy session. Action. The stuff that we haven't got time to do now. Mm. Looking forward Absolutely. to running off love and peace to everybody thank you so much thank you so much thank you but yeah action needs to come from this take care diane see you later everybody so do we join the next session now guys i think yes, neil's going to explain neil will do